Okay. Well, welcome to a physics project working session where we're actually going to talk about mathematics, I think, although it might turn out to be more related to physics than we know. So Jonathan has been doing a bunch of work that I understand comparatively little about, about modernizing the understanding of what real numbers are, if I understand correctly. So actually, sure. how, about, how about a reminder, first of all, about what are real numbers? What, what, is, what is the traditional view of what real numbers are? Yeah, okay. That's a good question. So um, generally, okay, th th there, are, there are sort of two schools of thought to this, right? There, there's, as with most objects in mathematics, you can define them constructively by giving some explicit algorithm that tells you how you build a real, or you can define them axiomatically by saying, here are the sort of constraints that we expect real numbers to obey. Um, so there are some, there are various kind of tr cl like classical logic constructions that exist in the reals that people, some people will likely be familiar with. So Cauchy sequences is kind of, I think amongst mathematicians, the most famous example, it's the one that's normally taught in analysis classes, where you say effectively the reals are the metric space completion of the rationals. So the rational, everyone knows there's no ambiguity about what the rationals are, right? They're just ordered pairs of, of, of naturals, uh, with, you know, with, with some equivalence relation. And then you just say, if I, if I now include, so if I look at all the Cauchy sequences, all the sequences of rationals where the terms get successively closer together, uh, and I just include all the limit, if, if I adjoin all the limit points of those Cauchy sequences, that's one way for me to construct the reals. So, so, so let me just understand something. And even in talking about that, are we talking, are we thinking of that kind of combinatorially? Like I could take, I mean, by the way, you, you said very quickly, you know, about the rationals with the equivalence relation, right? With a, with a which is to say, you know, you're canceling, you know, numerator and denominator, which, you know, is a straightforward operation. I think we understand that, but that could get non-trivial in our kind of world. Okay. Sure. So, so now let's, let's, you're saying these Cauchy sequences. So how do I pick? I mean, if I think about actually generating a Cauchy sequence that converges to something, how do I do that? Uh, or does that not really define? You just say it's any sequence of rationals that has this property that the distance between them gets smaller. Right, right. And, and obviously in general, there'll be, there's an infinite equivalence class of Cauchy sequences that, that, you know, that can be used to generate any given real. Um, right, but it, it's not obvious if you would imagine computable Cauchy sequences where you say, I want, I mean, is, is that a thing where you say yes. it's a computable Cauchy sequence? Right, right. I mean, this is the whole basis of, well, this is not the whole basis. It's, it's, one of the ideas that's contained in this in this field of constructive analysis, right? The idea of looking at which parts of analysis can you know can you still do if you enforce the constraint that everything be con everything be constructible and therefore computable. Um, and so, so yeah, if you've got a Cauchy sequence, so so that would mean I've got a Turing machine and it's spitting out the you know the numerators and denominators. Right, right. But what are the 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 computable constructible reals? Are presumably a tiny subset of all possible reals. I, well, indeed, yes. Um, I mean, but by it's definition, zero because they're, they're they're countable. Right. Exactly. Exactly. There are countably many Turing machines, so there are going to be countably many reals that you can generate by that procedure. And and how what happens when you oracle up the Turing machines? Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, so there there is some. I know there has been work on looking at kind of um, what changes when you go to different levels of the arithmetical hierarchy in terms of. Uh, what kinds of analysis you can do. Um, I don't know offhand exactly how that hierarchy works, but I know that that's something that has been investigated. My guess is to get to all of the reals, you have to go to all levels in the arithmetic hierarchy. Is that? Is I, that think that, I think that's right. It's certainly the case that if you just go, if you just use, uh, if you just go to kind of sigma one or pi one, that's not enough to encode all of analysis. Um, I see. But so, so with the constructible reals, just so I know, I mean, what kind of theorems and analysis are still true? Are there still continuity results that are true or are none of yes. those things true? No, no. So, so actually, that, that's the surprising thing is that a shockingly large amount of, well, okay, here's an amusing fact, right? That, you, that I don't know how well known it is. I, I, I presented it at a talk uh, several weeks ago as though it were a well-known fact and several people in the audience got confused. So maybe it's not as well-known as I think it is. But in constructive analysis, every function is computable. Um, which is obviously not the case in conventional analysis. Okay, let me understand. Yeah, that. So yeah, that's because you could just feed in the Turing machine that generated the reals. In other right. words, 
Sorry, is there, every function is continuous. Did I say computable? Oh, I, I, you said computable. Okay. I, that sorry, I, I meant to say continuous. Every, every function is continuous in, in constructive analysis. That's completely not obvious to me. Right. Um, so that occurs because, so it occurs precisely because of the fact that most real numbers are non-computable. So imagine, write it, so imagine you have a function with a discontinuity. So you have some point, you have some real number X naught uh, for, you know, um, below which you've basically got one piecewise continuous function, you know, uh, above which you've got another you know, piece of the piecewise continuous function. Um, so to be able to evaluate that function for any value of X, you would essentially need the order relation on the reals to be decidable because you would need to be able to determine for any given X, whether it's greater than or less than X naught yes. or um, less than or equal to X naught. Um, and in general, we know that that's not going to be the case. That the the, the order, the, order the standard, like the the computable order relation on the reals, is only a partial order. There are cases of reals where you won't be able to compute whether one is larger than the other. Um, and as a consequence, if you want your function to be entirely computable, it has to be. It can't contain. Wait a minute. I'm I'm confused by that because you know computable computability is a thing where you feed in countably many inputs. How do you feed in? Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if you want to ask the question, if you've got a computable order relation function and you're feeding it in inputs, which are genuine reals, mm -hmm. how do you even feed it a genuine real? Well, I mean, so if you have, like, depending on your construction of the reals, there, you know, there can be a generate, there can be a finite, finitely expressible generating function for at least the computable fraction of the reals. Okay, but wait a minute. For the computable reals, I get it. You can feed a computable real to a computable function that's doing an order relation. That part right, I but understand. The, even on the computable reals, the order relation is not computable in general. Okay, let me understand that. So you're saying, I mean, in general, so I, I'm well aware of the fact that, for example, if you, you know, if you do square roots and things, you say is the square root of blah, 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 plus blah, 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 greater than or less than whatever. That turns out to be decidable. That's Tarski's decision procedure. If you right. include trigonometric functions, all bets are off. You can't do yes. it anymore. And, and the reason for that is that each one of those symbolically represented functions has some set of equivalences which don't necessarily, I mean, you, you, can't, you can't necessarily corral those two representations of constants to be something which is comparable. Right, exactly. And, and the same thing happens even with computable reals. So if you imagine the case of, say, continued fractions, if you, yeah. take, uh, if you take two continued fraction representations of reals, where the continued fraction representations are, are produced by some computable generating function, mm -hmm. the fact that the generating functions are computable does not guarantee that the continued fraction representations are comparable. Even uh, equality is undecidable in that case. Okay, so is the reason for that, given two Turing machines, that even comparing two Turing machines is a challenging business? Right, that, is that right. the reason, basically? In effect, yeah. I mean, so if you want to be very explicitly computational irreducibility about it, you can say that with all of these things, continued fractions, Dedekind cuts, Cauchy sequences, they're all effectively limiting procedures. So you can write down a generating rule for that limiting procedure, but determining equality or determining inequality involves asking about, you know, what is the actual limit of that, of that sequence or that sort of process is computable. You're now asking about effectively an infinite time limit. Um, and that in general, obviously. Right, so, so I mean, were you to plot these things, you would find those two different Turing machines as you go to each iteration, they would wiggle around and if you plot their values, they would be, you know, jumping one is greater than the other than the other and so on, as you go to successive terms in the continued fraction or whatever else. Right, and, exactly. And the point... and it becomes an irreducible problem of whether the things are eventually gonna converge. Okay, so, so your statement is even with, I'm trying to understand, we're, we're unwrapping two levels here. So your first statement is, Order relations are not computable even for the computable reals, basically. Yes. Right? And uh, point number one. Point number two, you then said all computable, all functions of computable reals, which presumably map computable reals to computable reals, yes. are continuous. Well, yeah, all, all computable functions of computable reals. Um, okay. Which, which and a computable function of a computable real is still a little bit tricky for me to understand because the computable real is the infinite time limit of that computable. I mean, you can state, you know, here's my Turing machine. It's going to generate this sequence, but the actual real number is the limit of that sequence. 
Yes, right. But but in a sense, a bit like what we did with that prototype of the infinite list framework in Mathematica, you effectively identify the real with the generating function. You yes. don't identify with the infinite limit because the infinite limit in general won't be, you won't be able to determine right. that. Okay, so, so now what happens is the computable real function maps the Turing machine that represents that the a computable real to a Turing machine that represents the result of the function on that computable real. Right, right? exactly. So it's a Turing machine to Turing machine function. Right. It's just that it happens to be the case that those Turing machines have an interpretation as reals. Yes. But it's kind of an interesting thing, a Turing machine to Turing machine function. The, the main place we've seen Turing machine to Turing machine functions is in the emulation of one Turing machine by another. Right. I mean, in other words, in, yeah. when you do computation universality or computational equivalence of some kind, that is a place where you map Turing machines to Turing machines. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, with some, right. although, uh, okay, but, but so in this, this is a case where your function is mapping Turing machines to Turing machines. Now, what's the statement of continuity? Uh, so there, there is a, do you mean what's like formally, how, how do you define continuity in the case yeah. of computer? So there yeah. is a there's, a, there's a continuity principle that I think is due to Lovier. Um, I would need to look up precisely how it works, but it's, I mean, it's effectively, you can, it's the same as the, as, as the sort of topological definition of continuity. You're, you're basically saying, I want the, the image of open sets to be open. Um, and you can still define, you, you can define a topology on this set of computable reals. And so you, you, know, you have a natural definition of open sets. And so that, that kind of- that This is where, up. you know, whenever one discusses this stuff, whenever open sets come up, that's where my intuition sort of flies apart. So explain, so the, the, an open set on the computable reals mm -hmm. means something where there is no, in, in, in the set of computable reals, there's no boundary to that set. I mean, that, that's the sort of, that's the, the topological intuition that comes from thinking about real numbers, right? But I mean, yeah, so, so the standard way this gets introduced is, yeah, you, you, you start from the intuition of, an, of like an open interval, the, you know, the idea of something that just doesn't have a boundary you, mm -hmm. where you can, or strictly speaking, you know, it's, it's a subset that doesn't contain its limit points. Yep. Um, which, is, then, which is essentially a statement of, of sort of, it's, that is a natural thing to think about because then in some sense, every point is, is on an equal footing. It's a, it's a level playing field of points. There aren't special points which are boundary points and other points which are not boundary points. In, in a sense, yeah. yeah. Uh, and so then, then, but what you can do is, that, so the, and the, the whole basis of sort of point set topology or general topology is that you, that you then say, well, let's kind of treat the open sets like they are the fundamental objects, right? So mm -hmm. when, you, when you take a space, or you take, sorry, you take a set and you turn it into a topological space, you equip it with a topology all that topology is, is just a collection of, of subsets that correspond to the open sets of that space. And yep. so now you're, you're operating directly at the level of open sets. And so then because the sort of general definition or a general definition of, of continuity of functions is just that the pre-image of any open set is open, then continuity depends on what topology your space is equipped with. So if, clearly if the space is equipped with the discrete topology, then every function is continuous because every, every subset is an open set. Um, so if it's equipped with the, with the sort of the, the finest possible topology, then everything becomes continuous. If it's equipped with the coarsest possible topology, the trivial topology, then nothing is continuous except for sort of an, like a, an identity function that, that just maps the space right. to itself. And then in between, you'll have different functions being continuous. And, and, and the, so the point is that the set of computable reals, we can equip it with a topology. In fact, we can equip it with a topology that's kind of as close to the standard topology that real numbers have in the non-computable case. Um, and then that gives, and that, that lets us define a topological notion of continuity in exactly the same way as we normally would. Okay, hold on, hold on. When you say you equip the real, the computable reals with a topology, how do you do that? How do you define the open sets for computable reals? Well, I mean, as with any set, it's, it's effectively arbitrary how we do that. Um, so what you can do is you can just say, well, we know what the topology is for the ordinary, you know, real numbers, including the non-computable ones, and we can just copy over as much of that as we can to the non-computable case. But, but the one, one issue with an open set, right, is that any limit in the open set must land in the set. There isn't something where, where the limit ends on the boundary. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, again, that's the intuition that comes from thinking about 
you know, something like a real number. Right, but, but so that defining a sequence in this open set that you've set up, the op open set is essentially a collection of Turing machines. And what you're mm -hmm. saying is, if you take a limit in the space of Turing machines, you will always land, there will be no special boundary of the set of Turing machines. For, for, for a set of Turing machines that is to be considered an open set of Turing machines, there is no special boundary Turing machine which you get to. Is that a true statement? Right, because, and, and, and in the more general context, all that's saying is that every element of the open set is treated on the same footing. Well, I understand that, but why is it obvious? I mean, how, you, how do you get the limits? You know, how do you take those limits? In the space of Turing machines, you're taking a limit somehow. What are you doing to get to that limit? Because in the case of real numbers, you're saying the limit is defined by things which get ever closer in value, so to speak. But what is a limit in the space of Turing machines? Well, this is what distinguishes topology from geometry, right? So, so again, I, as I say, the intuition of open sets comes from thinking about, say, intervals on the real line, where notions of limits, notions of convergence, et cetera, exist, and we kind of understand intuitively how that works. But to be able to define something like that requires, you, you need a metric, right? So on the real numbers, that's just the absolute value metric. Um, the point is when you go to general topology, you don't have a metric anymore, or you're not guaranteed to, you just have a topology. Yeah. And so then what you're, what you're effectively asking is, well, let's look at sort of the algebra of open intervals as they occur on the real line, for instance, and let's see how that works. And then let's just define a topology in such a way that the, that the open sets in, that, you know, in our topology satisfy the same uh, you know, algebraic axioms as open intervals on the real line. And so in, in the case of open sets, that's just saying, you know, if I take a disjoint union of open sets, or if I take a, 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 an intersection of open sets, I get another open set. And so okay. all I'm doing is I'm saying my topology is just a collection of subsets where if I take uh, a disjoint union or if I take an any finite disjoint union or any finite intersection, I'll get another open set. And so then that's preserving in cases where there is a metric that's like the metric on the real numbers. It's preserving that intuition about limits, but it's, allow it's allowing you to define a notion of openness that doesn't require you having a to have a metric. Right, fair enough. Okay, so all right, so we've, we've now, now I understand your claim that on the computable reals, all computable functions, all computable real functions are continuous. Right, right. In the Which sense that their pre-image is the pre-image of any open set. When you feed it back through that function, it remains an open set. It can't develop a boundary, so to speak. Um, right. Let's... Right. let's do that one more time. What, why, what is the quickest intuition for why it can't develop a boundary when you look at the pre-image? Okay, so the point is, I guess, that... I think we... it can't get rid of the rind. If the thing has an outer rind in the pre-image, there's no way when you feed it through that function to get rid of the rind. Yeah, I mean, in effect, that's what it's saying. Um, I'm trying to work out what I mean, wh why it's obvious that that should be the case. Um, it, I mean, it, yeah, it ultimately comes down to this fact that to distinguish between what is rind and what is non-rind requires you to be requires a comparison between arbitrary reals that we know you can't do. I see that you can't do computably, and therefore yeah. the computable function can't untangle that. Right, exactly. Okay, so, because if the so, inverse is, if the function is computable, then its inverse should also be computable. Um, right. So the basic point is to find the rind, to find the out, the x, the boundary of the set, is non-computable. Right. Exactly. So, so, so you so in other words, you can't have a function that systematically strips it out, or puts, or for that matter, puts it in. Okay. So so then, what would it mean to have a non-open set? And what you're saying is that open sets might be computable but non-open sets could not be computable because they couldn't find their, couldn't, they couldn't define their boundary. Right, right, yeah. So, if, so yes, if you looked at the image of a, of a non-open subset of the computable reals, that image is not guaranteed to be, I think you're right, that, that image would not be guaranteed to be computable. So in other words, it's basically saying to construct a closed set on the computable reals is not necessarily a computable operation. A non-open set. Yeah, a non-open set. What is the difference between a non-open set? A set <laughs> with boundary. Is, 
this is the bane of every topology of every uh, sort of undergraduate topology okay, student. Well, I, that, okay, so explain that no, to me. What, no, what, no, what not, you can have sets that are both closed and open. You can have so-called clopen sets. So um, a, a, a closed set is defined as being a set whose complement is open. Okay, all right, fine. I shouldn't have said that. A non-open set. A, a non-open set, yeah. Okay, all right, fine. Okay, so now we've, we've, we've talked through a little bit how you get the reals with Cauchy sequences, or at least how you get computable reals, how you get, how you get the reals with this rather undefined way of taking limits, which sort of can't happen in our universe probably. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and then how you get these constructible reals with limits which just correspond to being generated where the, where the terms in the, in the sequence are generated by Turing machine. Right, right. So okay. as it turns out, for the kind of stuff that we've been doing, Cauchy sequences are not sort of ideal for that. I mean, they're, they're, they're the construction of the reals that, as I say, I think most mathematicians are most familiar with because they're, they're sort of the more analytic way of thinking about reals. Uh, but they turn out not to be very nice to work with precisely for this reason that you effectively have to, you have to have some function that, that, that applies to these sort of infinite generating functions. Continued fractions actually, as it turns out, are even worse because, um, so, okay, the problem with the Cauchy sequences is that the order relation turns out to be non-computable. The problem with continued, uh, with continued fractions is that even operations like addition turn out to be non-computable because, uh, the, as you know, the continued fraction representation of, an, of a rational number works differently to the continued fraction expansion of an irrational number. So if you take two continued fractions... the terminating, the continued fraction expansion, just like the digit expansion, of a rational number, well, the, the digit expansion is periodic, the continued fraction expansion terminates. Right, exactly, exactly. And so the consequence of that is that if you take, if you add uh, two irrational continued fraction numbers together, in order to work out the continued fraction expansion of the result, you need to have a procedure for determining ahead of time whether the answer is going to be rational or irrational. And that is not it's, that's okay, so, so let me understand how that would be. Because I mean, in a sense, there could be a generating Turing machine for the continued fractions. You've got mm -hmm. two continued fractions generated by Turing machines. And now you say, what is the Turing machine, which is the generator of the combined continued fraction? Right. And your claim is that, that to find that Turing machine is in general an uncomputable operation. Yes, right. Uh, is that obvious? Um, it's not. It's totally surprising to me. I mean, in other words, you can. So it, it it would it would be computable if you if you could know whether the result was going to be rational or irrational. Well, I think that, but the intuition I think is that when when you're doing the addition of these things, you essentially have carries going backwards and forwards. And by the time you're trying to get the exact answer, the carries that could happen as you as you try and, I mean, it's a generalized carry because it's a continued fraction of digit expansion, that the generalized carries could run arbitrarily far back and forward. And that is not something you can cover in a computable operation. That's what I suspect. Right. I, th I think something like that is true, yeah. But now what about, I mean, for the digit, okay, but, but what's the construction of the reals? Is it effective with the Cauchy sequence construction of the reals when I just use digit sequences? I mean, you can think, yeah, you can think of it that, that way in the sense that it's a, you know, that the that the powers of ten form form a Cauchy sequence. Okay, so so in other words, one possible, so it is the same bucket of of thinking about what the reals are to say a real is just a sequence of digits. I mean, that's what you know Turing originally did in in his computable reals, you know, his original Turing machine paper. I think is he had the Turing machine generate the digit sequence. Right. Right. Exactly. And that's equivalent, you say, to the Cauchy sequence idea. Is that true? Yeah, in, in the sense that place values, you know, as you add successive place values, that, that you know, you're just adding powers of 10 in, in, in such a way that you get a conversion Cauchy sequence. Okay, all right. So that so that's that idea for how to do it. So then you were mentioning continued fractions. Were you going to mention Dedekind cuts as well? Well, yes. So, so, so the actual technique that Georgios and I have been using for this uh, topos theoretic construction of the real stuff is the Dedekind cut uh, approach because it has neither of these undesirable characteristics. It turns out that when you do a Dedekind cut um, construction of the reals in, a, in an arbitrary topos, um, at, least, um, well, at least in a topos that has sufficiently many points that, that you can define a, a spatial locale, um, then both the algebraic operations like addition, multiplication, et cetera, and the order theoretic o operations are sort of as computable as they can be. Um, okay, let's, let's unwrap this for a second. Okay, let's start off with the, the Dedekind cuts.
Mm -hmm. um, remind me how those work. So the idea that with the Dedekind cut is you say, um, okay, so there's a classical, one thing about Dedekind cuts is they differ slightly whether you do them in classical logic or non-classical logic. So the, 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 the classical logic case is you say, every, I, can, I can think of every real number as uniquely partitioning the set of rationals into all the rationals that are say less than or equal to that real and all the rationals that are larger than that real. So I have a sort of left-handed cut and a right-handed cut. So square root two, I can think of all the rationals less than or equal to it or greater than it. Um, and so obviously in a non-classical, sorry, in a, in a classical logic, uh, I don't need to specify both the left-handed cut and the right-handed cut. I can just specify the left-handed cut and then the right-handed cut is just the complement. Um, but for a non-classical logic in which you don't have the law of excluded middle, that isn't actually true. And, and so in fact, uh, in a topos, uh, unlike in, you know, in, unlike in a classical mathematics construction, the sort of one-sided Dedekind cuts actually obey slightly different properties to the two-sided Dedekind cuts. But at least in the in the oh. in the familiar classical case, it's fine. So wait a minute. What you're saying here is one side is greater than root two, the other side is less than root two. So you're saying that those two things, the greater than and less than signs, in classical logic, one thing is just the not of the other, and the law of excluded middle says that that works that way. Right, but right. if you remove the law of excluded middle, it is no longer the case that a less than b is not of a greater than b, so to speak. I don't know what the equality. Yeah, great, great, greater than or equal to. But yeah, but 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 yeah, that, that that's the idea. So so actually, the, it turns out that the topology of the of the one-sided Dedekind cut reals is subtly different to the topology of the two-sided Dedekind cut reals in a in any co uh, mathematical context where the law of excluded middle doesn't hold. Okay. All right, okay, so we've got a Dedekind cut idea. Now, what's the, what's the computable real story of the Dedekind cut? Right, so, so uh, if you, the nice thing about Dedekind cuts is that you just need to have a procedure for comparing rationals, which is comparatively easy, right? So you just need to have, you know, basically as long as you have a cancellation procedure and, you know, some kind of procedure that can uh, equivalent denominators, then the Wait, order... But don't you have to compare it to the cut number? I mean, you have to compare each rational to the cut number, and well, that the, might be very difficult. But the, but in a sense, you just say, well, you're identifying subsets of the rationals with that cut. You, you, you never need to know what the cut number is, because the cut number in the Dedekind cut construction, you need to be able to know that everything outside of that cut is, in fact, you know, uh, strictly greater than the limit point or something. Um, so ultimately, all it requires you having is the is the um, order relation on the rationals, which is easy to reduce to the order relation on the naturals. And, you know, we kind of know how that Fine. works. Fine. But right. But I mean, but but so if it was a computable number that at which the cut was occurring, then you're saying that to determine whether that Turing machine that represents the computable number is greater than or less than a rational is a computable operation. Uh, well, it can be. So th th there'll be cases where it isn't, um, even for the case of, well, no, actually, no. For rationals, you should always be able to determine the limit. I think so. so. No, no. For rationals, it should be fine, yeah. Because that's, that's basically like running a loop checker, because a rational, in a sense, is a, it's a finitely specified thing. And worst yeah. cases, the Turing machine doesn't halt, but you just are running some finite loop checker, I think. Mm -hmm. um, okay. All right, so what happens next? The Right, right. Okay, so so th so the point is that the the Dedekind cut construction, in, in you know conventionally we think about it set theoretically. So an obvious question is, what if we now you know a, a, a topos is kind of designed to be a, a, a you know a, a category that behaves like the category of sets in some loose sense, right? So so a lot of set theoretic mathematics, you should be able to just translate to the context of a topos without really modifying it very much. Okay, let's get some definitions here. What is a topos? Okay, so there's a there's a formal definition of a topos, and there's a there are several informal definitions. The formal definition is that it's any category that has finite uh, limits, and in, and in which you have a power set object, effectively, in which objects have power. power objects. By, by finite limits, you mean you you iterate the morphisms, and you eventually get to something mm -hmm. that stops, or what? No, no, I, I mean limit in the in the category theoretic sense. So 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 a limit in a category theoretic sense is something that generalizes essentially the notion of an intersection in set theory. So how does it work? I mean, you know, what I know of a category, it's got a bunch of objects and a bunch of morphisms. Now mm -hmm. what? Right, so, so, the, so if, you, if you want to take a limit 
of a functor, um, the limit is essentially a thing that can, if you have a sort of cone diagram, a, 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 a limit is a thing that sort of completes that cone diagram in such a way that certain universal properties are, are satisfied. So hold on, hold on, hold on. We've got morph morphisms running between objects and we've got some functor that's mapping one set, one set of morphisms to another set. Mm -hmm. Now you're saying this limit is a limit of the functor or what? Or you, you, yes. you're keeping on going mapping from morphisms to morphisms to morphisms with this functor. Is the, is the functor being iterate? What, what is happening to the functor? How does it make a limit? No, no, so, so the term limit uh, simply corresponds to the fact that it's a way of, um, okay, the intuition comes from analysis in the sense that if you have, if you imagine having a sequence of, uh, if you imagine a Cauchy sequence or something, then a way that you can characterize the Cauchy sequence is by its limit point. So it's a way of taking this whole big sequence of numbers and summarizing it with just a single number. Mm -hmm. And the idea with uh, with a categorical limit is it's the same kind of idea. It's, it's a way you, you take essentially a functor and you summarize it with just a single object. Okay. And and so in, in the particular case where you if you had a string of morphisms that was effectively corresponding to a Cauchy sequence, then the categorical limit would be the analytic limit, but it's a much more general construction. Xerxes is making a comment here. Xerxes, can you say what your comment is? Right, uh, I, I'm just saying that uh, one one uh, way to think about this would be thinking in terms of pullbacks uh, as limits. Pull, pullbacks are examples of limits in, in category theory, and it, it, usually in the in the non-category. What, what is a pullback? Yes, yeah, so sure that's what. In, that? in the non-category theoretic sense, we use pullbacks as in as in uh, abstracting some function to some other space in in a, in, a, in a loose way. So here, what's happening is. In the categorical sense, you, you have some functors and some objects, and now you want to somehow abstract them to more general classes. And in a way, a pullback is using that same intuition that you have for the normal pullbacks, but you're, you're kind of abstracting it to certain unique objects. And then you have to draw these category th theoretic diagrams. So the, the way to think about the limit over here is as if you're taking some functor or some, some elaborate functor or object and abstracting its essence to some unique uh, set of arrows and, and objects. And in that sense, this is the limiting object. That, that's the way limits are used here in category theory. I'm still well, so, so Go ahead. In, in the general sense, it's isolating a, what, what's called a cone that satisfies certain universal properties. And those universal properties are the generalized universal properties of products, pullbacks, and inverse limits. So, so, so in, 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 in a way, you're really trying to extract certain universal objects with those universal properties. You, you take a given uh, elaborate construction and you ask what is its universal object, uh, representative. That's what, that's what the limit re uh, relates to. Really. But, but like I said, because of this relation to, to categorical products, I think it's particularly in a topos theoretic sense, it's useful to think of these as being some kind of ultimate generalization of, um, of effectively intersections. Right, so 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 limits, as with products and pullbacks, behave a bit like how you'd expect set intersections to behave. So, for instance, if you were to take the limit of an identity, so like the, the the standard illustrative example that I think is used in Maclean is if you take the limit of an identity functor, then it singles out an initial object, that is to say, an object which has just kind of one, you know, one outgoing morphism, and that is the sort of you can think of that as being the category theoretic analog of saying that if I take uh, a union of all possible subsets. Sorry, if I take a if I take an intersection of all possible subsets, I get the empty set. Yes, I understand that limit. I'm I'm fairly confused here. Maybe you should try. You said there were other intuitive definitions of toposses because I haven't really understood this limit in category theory. Um, okay. Okay. But, but, like I say, I, 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 I personally think it's, it's helpful just to think of a limit as being essentially some ultimate generalization of a set intersection and a co-limit as being the ultimate generalization of a, of a disjoint union. Um, because, you know, that's sort of... Okay, but even roughly, what is a set intersection in category theory? Well, the, the analog would be a categorical product. And a categorical product means what? It means two, two objects that are then separately mapped by their morphisms. Is that what you mean? Or what, what, is, it, what is a categorical product? 
Uh, well, it's again, it's it's if you take the product of a functor, it it iso it, it sort of uniquely isolates a, a, a particular cone diagram uh, that satisfies some some universal. Okay. What is the product? A functor is a mapping from morphisms to morphisms. What is a product of a functor? So you've got two. You're, you're you're taking effectively two categories, right? You've got one on each side of the functor. So when right. you when you take either a limit or a categorical product or a uh, or a pullback or whatever, you can think of those as being over those two those two right. categories. Nick is commenting one simply can't understand category theory without pictures. So if you want to draw some pictures, feel free. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, like this is the universal diagram that, that characterizes a limit. If that's helpful. Wait, 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 wait. wait. I, have to, I have to pin that bigger on my screen. Hold on. OK. Uh, what the heck is that? Uh, I do not understand this at all. So, so a limit is a way of taking any functor and uniquely specifying a cone diagram, such as this one, such that that cone is guaranteed to commute. Okay, the functor is the f. Is that right? Yes, the functor is the is the big f. Okay, and what is it mapping between? So it's mapping between categories C and D. Where's D? L so lowercase D. D. Okay. No, no. So so D I and D J are objects in the category D. Okay. Okay. Fine. Okay. Objects in the category D. Okay. I'm I'm completely confused. What does that left-hand category diagram mean? Sorry. What, what I, does that left-hand diagram mean? So this okay, right. Every object in the initial category C is being identified with a collection of morphisms from. So, so, so if you take an object lowercase C. It's mm -hmm. being identified with a collection of objects, f of d for some object d. Every object c in the category capital C, every object lowercase c in the, ca in the category capital C with some object d, lowercase di, in the category d. Is that correct? Right. In, in, in such a way that this... An object in the category c this is, a, uh, uh, this is a, this is an, a, I should say, this is a dual functor, right? So this is mapping from D op to C. What do you mean by, what is a dual functor? It goes both so ways? If you, take the, if you take the categorical dual of, of D, D op, mm -hmm. it's mapping from D op to C, which you can think of as being some, some dualization of the functor mapping from C to D. Which would normally be a, 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 an inverse mapping of some kind in, in an ordinary, you know, in yes, right. So all you're doing is you're taking D, you're inverting all the morphisms, um, and you're just considering a functor from that that opposite category, D op, back to C. Oh, I now understood what the op meant. Opposite. Okay, fine. Right. Um, the. Uh, um, but anyway, look, look, I mean, so, so the intuition I'm trying to put across is, you want your topos to be as close to the category of sets as possible. You want it to behave like the category of sheaves over the category of sets. So. You, you want an operation that behaves a bit like an intersection, because then if I take its dual, I get something that behaves a bit like a disjoint union. And that's what the limit gives you. If I, I can define this limit and, and its universal properties are the same as the universal properties I'd expect from a set theoretic intersection. I can take its dual and I get a co-limit whose universal properties are the same as the universal properties I'd expect from a, dis from a disjoint union. And I also want to have some procedure for taking power sets um, and so that's what this power object thing gives you. And the remarkable thing is that if you just if, if you have any category that has finite limits, so it's a finitely complete category and it has power objects, then it behaves enough like the category of sets that you can kind of do fairly general mathematics in that context. Uh, and you can port over a lot of kind of technology from set theory into that into that context. And that's what topos theory is really doing. Okay, so naive question here. I mean, like, like, um, you know, notions of finite, infinite sets, countability, you know, um, uh, 
non-countability, continuum hypothesis, all those kinds of things. How do those play out in this kind of generalized set theory of, of topos theory? Right, okay, so a bunch of those can be translated. Um, continuum hypothesis gets a little bit tricky because, um, yeah, there's a, bu there's a bunch of set theoretic technology, things like P names that let you kind of, you know, that they're, they're these crucial constructions that you need to sort of formulate the continuum hypothesis and its generalizations that they're essentially the the post sets that let you talk about cardinalities of sets within a different set theoretic universe those things have no obvious translation in topos theory so the continuum hypothesis gets a little bit a little bit squiggly but um but uh, you know other than that a bunch of these other these other things you mentioned kind of do, do have translations um, but but in the end what you're what you have been talking about which i don't yet understand at all is real numbers in the context of topos theory and for mm -hmm. that, you're going to need some notion of non, not, you know, of of um, uh, of, of non-countability. Right, right, right. Um, no, sure. I mean, so 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 that you can talk about whether you know whether two object sets or home sets or whatever have, you know, have bijections between them, whether they can be made isomorphic and things. And obviously, that mm -hmm. lets you introduce a notion of countability. Um, and okay. and so so the, the, I mean the, the whole hype because okay. So important point to note, right? So th there, there are these two types of toposes, topoi, um, that people often care about. There are the elementary toposes and there are the Grothendieck toposes. So elementary toposes are generally the things that people care about in logic. Grothendieck toposes are generally the things that people care about in topology. And the only difference between them is that, so what I was giving you before was the definition of an, ele of an elementary topos where I said it has finite limits, fin you know, where finite coproducts and those kinds of things. Um, if we now relax that constraint and say it just has to have small limits and small coproducts and so on, then you get this, this definition of a growth and topos. So small in this context just means that the, so obviously finite means that the objects, uh, a finite category just means the object set and the home set are both finite sets. Small means that they are sets and not proper classes. So that? a small category. So uh, if I, if I can represent my object set as a set and not, and I don't need to use effectively class theory to represent it. And if I can represent my home set as a set and I don't what, need what to is the, Okay, what, what is the distinction between these? Between which? Sets sorry? and classes. So, so, uh, so pr proper classes allow you to represent collections of objects that are too large to be represented by sets. So they occur, for instance, in the theory of inaccessible cardinals. So, okay, so set theory, so the axioms of ZFC don't, do they let you talk about things beyond sets? Or do they? Uh, they don't let the, you talk about things beyond sets, but they do implicitly assume classes. Because in a sense, when you, when you quantify, it, it, okay, the axioms of, ZF, of ZFC are written using universal quantifiers. Mm -hmm. And every object that you're quantifying over is a set. Okay. And so you are quantifying over some collection of sets. But the axioms of ZFC themselves tell you that no set can contain effectively the domain of discourse of set theory, because you need to, you need to have something which contained every set. And that doesn't, that's disallowed. So the, the domain of discourse over which, you, your, you know, over which your quantifiers apply in ZFC set theory is not actually a set, it's a proper class. So in ZFC, a proper class is left undefined, but it oh, is hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. When you quantify in ZFC, you're telling me that, I mean, so, so if I do quantification in piano arithmetic, for example, I'm quantifying over, uh, what the heck am I quantifying over? Because integers aren't even defined in piano arithmetic. What, now I'm what totally is, confused. What are you quantifying this, over in any of these axiomatic theories? This is where proof theory meets model theory, right? So, so models, what a model is, is it's defining a domain of discourse. It's defining the thing over which you're quantifying and over which your sentences are quantifying in your formal theory. Yeah, okay. So in a sense, any set of axioms, you can think of them as being like a program that just tells you for any element of my domain of discourse, is this thing an integer? Is it a set? Is it a group? Whatever. Sure, right. Um, so the point is that for yeah, so, so, so for piano arithmetic, if I define a model, I'm, I'm, what you're doing, what one is doing is one's defining a, a set or a class or whatever of, of objects. And you're, the axioms are saying which of these objects kind of behave like integers and, and, and right. sort of what their properties are. 
Um, and so with ZFC set theory, it's no different. It's just that the thi when you define a model, that, that the, the domain of discourse that's defined in your model cannot itself be a set. Okay, but hold on. The, the, the first point you were making there is, in general, you know, what are the axioms of piano arithmetic? The answer is, they are saying, consider all conceivable, one, one way of putting it is, consider all conceivable objects, ones that satisfy these constraints we will think of as being integer-like things. Mm -hmm. We know we can't nail down just the integers and nothing but the integers, that's a, the Gödel result, but, you know, they'll do it. But, but what you're saying is the thing that we are discussing you know, the thing that we are trying to put the cookie cutter down on to decide these particular pieces of the, of the cookie dough are what correspond to integers. You're discussing what that thing, what that proto construct is, mm -hmm. right? And you're saying that proto construct is what? Is classes or what? Right, right. So, so in, for ZFC set theory, it has to be classes. So the what reason is a class? Class? what is a class? What's the definition of a class? I mean, well, so it, there doesn't there need to be some other axiomatic system that defines what a class is. Well, yes. So, so ZFC set theory, with any axiom system, there's ultimately going to be something that you have to leave undefined. So you can't say I'm quantifying over a set because the whole point of ZFC set theory is it's defining what a set is. You can't use the definition of a set in that definition. So you start with some prior notion that's left undefined. And for ZFC, that's a, a class, just some, some collection of objects. And we, we don't we don't ask what that you know what that actually means. Hmm. Um, and so for ZFC, we know that it's a proper class because it's your domain of discourse has to be strictly larger than any set could be. Because what it contains proper, what does proper mean in proper class? So so proper means a class that isn't itself a set. So so the idea the the intuition with class theory is that it, it's every set is a class, but not every class is a set. So is there other axioms of class theory? You can axiomatize it if you wanted to, but no, I mean, no, no, no one does. I mean, it's, it's most useful as a kind of- um, A catch-all. A catch-all, some kind of ontological prior to set theory that we leave undefined. Um, but yeah, so the, the, the point is that, the, that if you had a domain of discourse for ZFC and it was a set, you would be violating the axiom schema of specification because it, in a sense, you would, you would need to have unrestricted comprehension to have, um, to have, that, to have a right. sensible- You know, I, I have to say, this whole hundred year adventure, or maybe it's a 2000 year adventure of axiomatizing mathematics, as you start kind of looking at the, you know, at the foundations of the foundations, there's just a lot of stuff that's built on quicksand there. I mean, you know, this is, I hadn't really thought this one through. I mean, I've always kind of imagined that, that um, uh, there is some base symbolic language and you are you know, cutting things out of it. But I guess I, you know, you can't define that language. That's another piece that is, okay. All right, all right. So we, we've got, where, where do we get to this from? You were oh, talking sorry. about so classes. The reason, I, the reason I was bringing this up is because if it, it, so when you relax this requirement of finiteness and you replace it with smallness, then you get these Grothendieck topoi, which is, a, is in effect, Grothendieck topoi are the more general case, elementary topoi are just the, um, just, just okay, but, but in general, I still don't have a good intuition for what a topos is. So a topos is something, I mean, in a set, the sort of minimal view of a set is it's a bunch of things. They could be potatoes or something, and they're all put together in, you know, in this basically just stuff you put in a bag. Okay, yep. what is the analogous picture of a topos? So if you think about well, if you think about the category of sets, first of all, the category of sets is a topos. It's kind of the prototypical topos. So the category of sets is the to is the category in which every object is a set, in which every morphism is just a function between sets. Okay. And so the point is that that the category of sets has certain properties. So in particular, you know, for instance, if I take any two objects, there should be a way that I can take their union or take their intersection, for instance. Um, and that should behave in certain ways. For any given object, I should be able to construct its power set, uh, you know, power object. Well, but by behave in certain ways, what you mean is the thing you get from doing the unioning can have the same morphisms act on it as the thing before you did the unioning. Yes, right, right, exactly. And, and same with the power set, you say? Yes. So, so the non-trivial point is there is this sort of external to the category operation, which maybe isn't external to the category in the end, but it looks external to the category operation, which under which 
you still have the same object morphism, object morphism type structure with the same morphisms. Right. So it, it's, it's external to the category in the sense that you, you formalize it as a functor. Between categories. Between categories, yeah. But wait a minute. But isn't it going back to the same? But isn't it going back here to the same category? Yes, it's, so it's, it's what's called an endo functor. So for instance, the, the, the power set construction is, uh, is, well, there are two ways you can formulate it. It's either a covariant or a contravariant endo functor, depending on which way around you. Okay. So, so by endo functor, all you mean is it's taking this category, it's mapping itself back to the same category. Right, right. Okay. So, so, so these kind of set theoretic operations in the category of sets, you can think of them as being endo functors, right? That, so power set, the power set operation is an endo functor from set to set. Okay, That's but although the union is presumably takes a pair of, of um, sets and returns a single set, uh, a single right, set. Right. So that that would be a, a, a that would be what's called a bifunctor. Uh, that so that's a, that's a functor on the product category of set cross set. What's the relationship between this product category thing and and the um, uh, uh, monoidal category business of of um... right? Okay, so so um. Uh, the, the notion of a categorical product is sort of prior to the notion of a monoidal product. Um, in fact, the, the way that you formalize a monoidal structure is, is, is itself as one of these bifunctors. The monoidal product is formalized as a functor from the product category, you know, C cross C onto C. Okay. Why does that happen in, in the interpretation of, of that monoidal product as completions in a multi-way system why does it work that way why is there a, why is it a a category cross category goes to category type thing well so in in the monoidal product is not really formalized as completions per se that's the completions are more like the construction of higher cells the monoidal product is is essentially in the multi-way picture is parallel composition so if i for instance take uh okay Canonical example would be if I take two string multiway systems, you know, one with a one with the rule A goes to A B, another with the rule A goes to B A, and I construct a new multiway system that has both rules applied sort of in parallel, then I get essentially a, I, get, I get what you can think of as being a monoidal product of the initial two multiway systems. And so now in the way that we formulated it, for instance, in our in our ZX papers, you can think of that as being a a a, 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 a Functor on the power on the power cat oh, sorry on the product category of the category of multiway systems with itself. It gives you a way of taking any two multiway systems and composing them to get another, in such a way as these as to ensure that these the, you know the, the defining features of a tensor product are are still obeyed. Okay, all right. So we've understood what the category of sets roughly is like. Now, how do we how do we make the jump to top losses? Right. So so all you do with top loss top losses, um, I think. That, P.T. Johnston insists that they should be called topos rather than topoi, but I think there's some dispute about this. Um, so is that you say, okay, I'm going to generalize, I'm going to use this much more abstract notion of, the, of a limit that we discussed as being the kind of generalization of these, uh, you know, union, intersection, et cetera, operations. And I'm going to introduce this notion of a power object, which lets me associate any, you know, any object in my topos with essentially some generalization of a power set. And those two things, finite limits slash small limits and existence of power objects is enough, you know, lifts enough of the structure from the category of sets to ensure that you can do something that looks like ordinary mathematics in much, you know, in these much more general categories. Okay, but, but in a piece of historical amusement, right, from the time that Cantor invented set theory in the 1880s or whatever it was, from, you know, limits of trigonometric series or whatever, to then we we zoom forward to the 1960s when you know 1962 the new math was invented and um, uh, you know they tried to teach school children like me set theory by which they meant you know you put potatoes in a bucket type thing and you know that's a set so to speak mm -hmm. what is the analogous understanding so that was a, a great simplification of set theory from the original highly abstracted version that Cantor had come up with. What, what is the analogous simplification of topos theory? Okay, so I would say that the intuition with topos theory is more topological than it is set theoretic. Um, in a sense, this is one of the reasons why 
people think the topos theory is kind of useful and powerful, right? It's that it, it, it because the you know set theory as traditionally one uses it in the foundations of mathematics is very algebraic, very axiomatic, and it's always slightly mysterious why why notions of spatial structure occur, right? What you know wh why should such a large class of groups also have a manifold structure. If you just define the group axiomatically using axioms, you know, using methods of set theory, the fact that there's this spatial structure that should that comes along with it that's somehow compatible with the group operations is, you know, appears quite quite mysterious. With a topos, though, well, hold on, hold on. What do we even mean by that? What we mean by that is that there is some. What is the abstract definition of geometry? The existence of a metric of some kind. Well, so yeah, so so geometry occurs when you have a topology and a metric. Yes. Okay. So, but it's the thing. The thing that's a surprise then is the definition of open sets or the fact that there's a metric. That, it's the in fact other that, words, that, that this thing that starts as dust ends up developing a well-defined, you know, metric that can be set up for it. Right, but actually, I mean, even relaxing, even ignoring the metric, the fact that you can even define a, a topology that's preserved by, you know, the fact that you can take this, this dust, as you put it, quite a nice analogy, and you can sort of agglomerate bits of the dust together to form open sets. And that, that, that there's a choice of agglomeration that in such a way that those open sets get, you know, are, are maintained under the action of the group. You know, if, 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 I, if I do group operations, they kind of respect my choice of open sets. Yeah, that's somewhat mysterious. That you know, the, I see. The, the, it doesn't shred them, basically. Exactly, exactly. So the the fact that topological groups are so ubiquitous is not a priori obvious if you just know the axioms of group theory. I, I so, so for example, in in the case of Peano arithmetic, the ordinary addition operations do not shred numbers, but the non-standard arithmetic operations probably do shred numbers. Right, right, exactly. Right, so the, the thing that's surprising is that there exist axiom systems that have, for which there are models that don't get shredded. Mm -hmm. And what is our intuition for why that is the case? I mean, I, I would think well, it's, it's, so... it's, we choose axiom systems that, for which there are models that don't get shredded. I mean, that will be an interesting criteria. That may be a I, component. I mean, you know, that's something one Sorry, could look at. One could, one could ask the question, is there, if we look at different axiom systems, something I've done a bunch of, is, you know, you look at different axiom systems and you ask the question, do certain, op well, let's think about this. Um, and you say, I see, I see. That's an interesting criterion. I've never thought about that. And, and you ask the question, if you make, agglomerations of elements there. Let's see. I see, do there exist models for which the operations that are defined in the axiom system do not shred agglomerations? Right. Yeah, that's, a, that's an askable, that, that's an empirically testable question. That would be interesting right. to know. And, and, and so the claim would be that there exists I mean, because the thing about piano arithmetic is there's a pretty ordinary model of the integers, and then the non-standard arithmetic is far, far away. For group theory, the models that exist are all kind of right there. They're all the different kinds of groups. They're not, it's not the case that there's one sort of ordinary group, and then there's a weird non-standard group that's far away. But yeah, go, go ahead. You, you, were, you were going to make, so the, the point you're making is it is a non-trivial fact. So you're saying in that it is not obvious in set theory why it should be the case that the models you have don't get shredded. Is that right? Yeah, in, in a sense, yes. Um, why structures that are defined in this, in this very axiomatic way should be equipable in such a large class of cases with a topology that isn't shredded by the operation. Yeah. yeah. Well, but but in some sense, you know, if we think about it like in quantum mechanics or something, it's like where's the ground state and where are the excited states? And in some sense, in, in piano arithmetic, you know, the ground state is the ordinary integers and the excited states are the are the non-standard integers. In group theory, 
the excite, you know, there isn't really a distinguished ground state. They're just all the different groups are sitting right there. And presumably as, as we go above, I mean, I don't know what models exist of group theory. Okay, here's a question I should know, absolutely should know the answer to. Is there any sense? No, there isn't. We, we know we can classify groups, right? So we know, oh no, I'm totally confused. What is the relationship between the classifiability of groups and decidability of the group axioms? Um, there isn't any obvious one because classification of groups is a model theoretic problem and decidability of group axioms is a purely proof theoretic statement. Um, but the fact that we can explicitly enumerate all possible models of group theory and describe them, does that not give us, I mean, does that not in a sense give us a way to prove anything by just saying, well, we'll just try it in all the groups or is there a problem with, with kind of, um, enumeration and countability and so on. Well, yeah, I mean, so I, I could have a decidable set of axioms, but if my domain of discourse is... For sure, but the other way around, namely in group theory, one has classified all of the models. Mm -hmm. And does that not mean... Wait a minute, is... Now I'm really confused. Gr group theory, I mean, the word problem for groups is certainly undecidable. Does mm -hmm. that mean that the group axioms are undecidable? Does that no. mean that there are statements in pure group theory that are undecidable? No, no. So, so the universal algebraic formulation of group theory as an equational axiom system is decidable. Okay. But the so fact when you that go the into a problem is undecidable is a consequence of the fact that when you introduce a model, that model has a non-trivial the, the elements of that model have non-trivial equivalence relations, and those can be undecidable. Okay, so so the basic point is when you append to the axiom system those additional relations which give you a specific group, the resulting axiom system can be undecidable, even though the universal axiom system is decidable, but it's the universal axiom system in which the classification of group theory exists. Presumably, yes. Right. So, okay, but, but, but um, let's see, what were we saying? We were saying, I mean, my claim was that this statement about shredding of, you know, does does there exist something? I mean, my claim was that it's just kind of like, like what's the distribution of, of um, you know, in what sense are the non-standard integers far away? I think the answer is that if you just take possible theorems of piano arithmetic, most of them will not be different in their truth value for, for yeah, right. If you just start enumerating theorems or propositions, most of them will be, there will, the divergence between the ones that are differently truth valued for non-standard arithmetic and for standard arithmetic happens only for large theorems. Whereas in group theory, the claim would be that even for fairly small theorems, you will get different results for different groups. Right. Okay, so, that, so that's a sense in which, I mean, you know, there's a sliding scale of how, uh, you know, how much you preserve models effectively in these things. But you're, you're explaining that Topos theory has, well, go, go ahead. You, you, were, you were explaining why it is more natural that space exists in, in if you base things on Topos theory than if you base things on traditional set theory. Right, right. So um, with, okay, th th there's, a, there's a particular class of, of Topoi, which, which we could call spatial Topos, uh, spatial Topoi. Um, which effectively mean that I can define what's called a frame, or equivalently, I can define its, its dual, which is what's called a locale. And um, in a sense, you can think of a locale as being a sort of generalization of the notion of a topological space. And you can think of the notion, uh, you can think of a frame as being a generalization of the sort of category of open subsets of a topological space. So, uh, so formally speaking, all that you're saying is a, a frame is just, is just a sort of you can think of it as being like a partially ordered set. So it has some, uh, you know, so oh, this is a consequence of the fact that certain open subsets can be larger than other open subsets. And it has small co-products, which act like the kind of join relation or the, you know, the disjoint union relation. It has finite limits, which means, which effectively generalize the meet operation. So they behave a bit like intersections, finite intersections. And there's an uh, sort of infinite distributed, an infinite version of the distributive law, um, which is a consequence of the fact that, you know, um, set containment acts in a distributive way. 
Uh, and so, th so that gives you this notion of a frame. And uh, a large class of toposes have interpretations as frames. And if I take the formal dual of this, of this frame category, then I get this notion of a locale, which is like the kind of ultimate generalization of a topological space. So it's in that sense that you can think of topos theory as effectively generalizing, um, as generalizing point set topology or generalizing general topology to the case of locales. Okay, hold on. Let me let me try and unpack that a bit. So, okay, what defines a topos? In other words, if I if if I wanted to send you a topos by email, what would I actually send you? So you would you would send a category, right? So a topos is just a category. So it's a collection of objects. Okay, and what would I actually send an email? What would what would be the finite thing that I would send an email? Well, a directed graph would suffice, right? A finite directed graph. Well, if the if the uh, object set and home set are, are finite. Okay, but even in the infinite case, what would I send? I mean, infinite email is only it doesn't really exist. So, what would right. I actually send? Would I send a Turing machine specification that would generate something? Yeah, I mean, it, it's the same as if you wanted to send an infinite set. If, if it were possible to generate this infinite topos by some, you know, by some computable, computable process, then you'd send an algorithm for generating it. Okay, fine. Okay, so, so then to send you a topos, infinite or not, I would essentially send you an algorithm that generates the, the objects and morphisms of some category. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, all right. And so... Okay, so what you're saying is for many, for many Turing machines, if in fact that generate toposes, it is the case. If I just pick Turing machines at random to generate toposes, your claim is that many of those will be these, what were you calling them? These toposes that have locales and so on, frames and locales. So they're often called spatial toposes. Okay, so, so if I pick a topos at random, you're saying that many of them, I mean, it's sort of an interesting analogy because if you pick a hypergraph rewriting rule at random, you can ask, does it have some limiting structure that is spatial? And so what you're saying is, is if you pick a, um, a topos at random, does it have a limiting structure that's spatial? Mm -hmm. And you're gonna make the claim that it often does. Right, right. And, and in a sense, the fact that it often does is not surprising when you consider one of the other definitions of what a topos is. So a slightly more informal definition of a topos, if you don't want to, if you don't want to think about you know, finite limits and power objects, is you can just say that it's a category that is equipped with some notion of localization, where all that really means is that it, localization is a procedure that lets you take some collection of morphisms and turn them into isomorphisms. So in the, if you want to think about it purely combinatorially, you're just taking a bunch of directed edges and you're turning them into two-way edges. Um, and that notion of localization uh, is, in a sense, what the finite limits and, and power objects are giving you in the formal definition of a topos. Uh, but that notion of localization essentially generalizes the idea of homotopy equivalence between spaces. Because um, in ordinary topology, you can have maps that are, you can have one way maps, but which are still invertible up to homotopy. And so if you look at the homotopy type of some space, it's naturally equipped with a notion of localization. Let me see if I understand that. So, okay, so first point is to be an isomorphism, we're, we're taking what would otherwise be a one way directed graph of morphisms. And we're saying that, um, that all those things are invertible. And that right. therefore we can go, okay, so w when you say you get, you know, you just go from a category that is a, has morphisms to a category that has isomorphisms, how do you do that going? Well, so, I mean, th th that just means you're, you're, you can add additional morphisms to the home okay. sets. With, yeah. Okay, fine. So we add the extra edges. And then we have a two-way edge. Oh, then we have edges going in both directions. Then we conflate those two edges to a single undirected edge. Right, right. Okay. And, okay. And what so, was so the... If, if you now think about, if you now think, think of it in terms of homotopy theory, right? So if you now imagine a category uh, in which every, uh, you know, a one-way map between open sets, 
But if we now mod out, and, and maybe that map is not invertible, but if we mod out by homotopy equivalence, very often we can make that map invertible. We mod out by homotopy equivalence. So what you're saying is, by, by homotopy equivalence, you say, can we go from one morphism, one, one edge here to another edge there, with, by just sort of making cross, you know, by, by some kind of, um, uh, you know, making sort of cross bridges and we never get stuck in some, uh, you know, non-trivial topological lump. Is that a? Is that yeah, a, yeah, you, 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 yes. I mean, that, yeah. That, in effect, that, that's that's. There's a that continuous means. deformation from one path to the other, where at every point on the path we can just sort of walk smoothly towards the other path. I mean, there's never a pond in the middle where we fall in. So we're, we're, right, you know, exactly. we can't so, yeah, get. So, that, so that, that's exactly what homotopy equivalence of, of paths means. Yeah, and so then, so you can obviously think, you know, um, the fundamental group pi one, pi two, et cetera. These, these classify effectively what the obstructions are to constructing homotopies in some arbitrary space. Um, and so you then, there's this notion of equivalence between topological spaces that's weaker than the notion of homeomorphism, uh, which is homotopy equivalence, where you effectively say that the, the, the obstructions or lack of obstructions to, homo to constructing homotopies between these spaces is the same. Um, and so the point is that if you consider maps between topological spaces, there can be cases where you can apply a map between two topological spaces that's not invertible, but that is invertible up to homotopy equivalence. Wait a minute. What do you mean by up to homotopy equivalence? You're saying you're saying if if I, there I, was I have, two, I have two topological spaces A and B, right? And I have a function f that maps from A to B. So it may be that there's no function that maps from B to A. But if I now consider instead of mapping from A to B, it's a function that's mapping from the equivalence class of all topological spaces, uh, the, you know, the class of all topological spaces equi homotopy equivalent to A and the class of topological spaces homotopy equivalent to B, very often, in fact, in almost all non-pathological cases, that if we mod out by homotopy equivalence in that way, we can make a non-invertible map invertible again. So what you're saying is a map that was from a specific space to a specific space might not be invertible. But were we to generalize to all possible uh, homotopically equivalent spaces that we then have something which is invertible. So it's like, right. it's like if, if you just took a particular, uh, you know, a particular subset of the integers versus you take uh, and, and you ask, does it map onto some other subset of the integers? That's a, a, a stricter, you know, it's easier to fail invertibility on that than it is to fail invertibility on a map from all the integers to all the integers. Right, right, precisely, precisely. Right, and okay. so in a, so in a sense, um, so when, when you start to think about homotopy theory in a categorical way, what that means is that the operation of modding out by homotopy equivalence, which is kind of the fundamental operation in, in homotopy theory, is a procedure for just taking some collection of arrows and turning them into, you know, taking some collection of morphisms and turning them into isomorphisms. That's how you can kind of operationalize this process of modding out by homotopy equivalence between spaces. Okay. Um, and so, so in, in, in the categorical, you know, in, in sort of algebraic topology and things, that's now become essentially the definition of what it means to mod out by homotopy equivalence. It's to, it's to take your, the, the, the homotopy, you know, the, 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 the category of, your, of, of, of topological spaces or some subcategory of the category of topological spaces and to localize it. In other words, to take some collection of morphisms and add inverse arrows. Okay. And so, this is why in this other definition of toposes, why it becomes so, why it's actually quite intuitive that they very often come with this notion of topological space attached to them and why they effectively generalize ordinary topology. Because a top, you know, one way, as I say, one way you can think of a topos is it's just a category that possesses some notion of localization. And so it, it, it's equipped with the same operation that, that, that Okay, it's equipped with an operation that is effectively is a generalization of the operation of taking, you know, uh, of taking the category of topological spaces and modding out by homotopy equivalence. So, okay, so the argument is, were you to have this category that has a bunch of isomorphisms in it, that you can think of the production of that category in terms of taking a bunch of the, the objects there are these, uh, you know, collections of spaces modded out by, by homotopic equivalence. And therefore, and, and why is it the case that if the isomorphisms are 
that, that you've got these things that are, you know, spaces modded out by homotopic equivalence. Why does that immediately, does that immediately tell you, I see a, a collection of spaces modded out by homotopic equivalence. Does that in some sense, is that naturally geometrical or could you have a bunch of wild things that didn't seem very geometrical at all that would still fit into the rubric of a set of spaces modded out by, by homotopic equivalence, a set, set of objects modded out by homotopic equivalence? It's certainly not geometrical um, because th there's no guarantee that any notion, any metric that you defined on a space would be preserved by the operation of modding out by homotopy equivalence. But it can still be spatial in the sense that your open set structure isn't completely torn apart by this operation. By which operation? By the oper by, by the modding out procedure. Okay. All right. I think I more or less get this. So, so let me just summarize again. So your claim is that in pure sets, the, when you're dealing just with sets, operations on sets are, have no reason to keep open sets coherent, so to speak, that they will in general uh, sort of somehow shred the structure of open sets. But you're making a claim that with certain conditions on that it becomes natural when there are these isomorphisms, it becomes natural to have things where the analog of open sets, which is the top osses, do not get shredded. Right. Why is this not a circular argument in some way? Wait, no, sorry, the, the, the open sets are not, the, sorry, the analog of the open sets is not the top osses. The, the analogs of the open sets are the objects in the top os. Or in the frame. Okay. Yeah, okay, fine. Um, and, and so, and in some sense, I mean, if you want to think of it from the other direction, right? We, you know, we know that there's this idea of an infinity groupoid where, you know, all higher morphisms exist and they're all isomorphisms because it's a groupoid. Um, and this gives you, you know, th this is effectively, um, well, again, there's some controversy in the algebraic topology of uh, it's a community of whether it's useful to say this is a topological space or it just has the homotopy structure of a topological space. But either way, an infinity groupoid is kind of some ultimate generalization of you know, the, 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 the homotopy type of, 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 of some topological space. And so what this localization procedure is doing is it's taking an arbitrary category and it's, take, and it's turning it locally into something that looks a bit like, a, you know, a section of an infinity groupoid. It's a very loose way of saying it, but it's- Okay, but, but what, you, what you're saying yeah. is that, that this isomorphism concept is it the case? Okay, super naive question. One feature of ordinary space is you get to go left and then you get to go right and that gets you back to where you started from again. Mm -hmm. Is that related to this isomorphism idea? I, I know it's not directly, but is the fact that typical space has this property that you can uh, translate in space and there's an inverse translation that always exists. In other words, if you imagine making space, which would be more like time, which doesn't have the possibility of an invertible, you know, invertible translation operation, what then do you, I mean, what are, okay, in terms of ordinary sort of mathematical spaces that aren't Minkowski signature space times, the notion that you can always go back where you, you know, you can always go back as well as forwards seems pretty critical to the notion of space normally. Well, I mean, it, it's critical to the notion of a, of a metric space because when you impose a metric, you're, you're implicitly imposing some symmetry group. Well, or, or, or put another way, the distance from A to B is the same as the distance from B to A. For, yeah, for a non-torsion metric. Right, but, but um, so... So if, if you, you, you could imagine constructing, for instance, even in ordinary Romanian geometry, you could have a, a, a space which doesn't have a Levi-Civita connection in which the contorsion tensor is kind of degenerate in the sense that uh, the, the, you know, in such a way as to make the torsion maximal, right? So that the distance from A to B is finite, but the distance from B to A is infinite. And with, a, as I say, with an appropriately degenerate choice of, choice of, uh, of contorsion tensor, you can do that. Um, and so that would be a case in which you, you, you no longer have uh, a, a, you know, a straightforward translation symmetry.
but but that would still be something that could arise from your isomorphisms with toposes, et cetera, your geometric topoi could still generate. If, if you looked at uh, sort of limits of your geometric topoi, you could still have one of these, you know, full of contortion spaces. Is that true? That's true because everything we're everything we're discussing so far doesn't is pre is pre geometric, right? There's there's no notion of metric. There's no notion of distance. Um, everything is topological. But I'm just trying to get an intuition about what it means this this isomorphism concept. What does that have to do with spatiality? I mean, in other words, spatiality is one feature of space is you sort of get to move around everywhere and you can sort of, you never get stuck in some sense. You get to, most of the time, you you know, in at least locally, you get to sort of move around and never regret your choice, so to speak. You can always get back to, to where you started from again. What feature, but that's not true in general for an arbitrary, you know, graph structure or whatever else, you can you can most definitely get stuck. And, and you would, and, and the, you know, the thing which is the essence of spatialness seems to be this idea that you get to move around and position things anywhere and not get stuck. So what is the correspondence between that idea and this isomorphism concept in, in, in geometric topoi? So, you're, so if we take some example of a pathological space where, as say, you have a degenerate contortion tensor or even something like a directed graph where you can end up in sinkholes or something, um, that those spaces will still be homotopy equivalent to some other spaces that don't have that pathology. Okay. Right, because if I take... Um, well, so, so I take, let's take the directed graph. You're saying that there is some kind of essentially completion of that directed graph that has the same, that is homotopically equivalent, but doesn't have sinkholes. Right, right, so, so I, I take some arbitrary digraph, for instance, one that's generated by a multi-way system. Right. And mm -hmm. I do this, this higher cell completion procedure that we, the, the Xerxes and I have been describing. And I get some object out of that. The argument would be that there is another graph that I could have started from that didn't have these sinkholes, but where the, the, the post-completion object would be the same. It's not self-evident to me that that would be the case, but it, it seems plausible. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean it's... It's definitely the case that there is some equivalence class because the the um, the set of objects that you can produce post completion is is smaller than the set of objects you could have started with. There's always going to be some, you know, it's, it's definitely a many to yeah. one mapping. Um, and then yeah, so even if you had some super path, because you know, so so one problem that would arise, one very critical problem that would arise with one of these degenerate spaces where there's essentially infinite torsion, is that a lot of maps would be non-invertible because if you had a map that sent a, you know everything to one side of the space, you can't get back again. Yeah. But if it's guaranteed that that space is now is, is can be made homotopically equivalent to some other space that didn't have this degenerate contortion property, then you could make that map invertible, and that's what this localization procedure is essentially encapsulating. So in okay, a sense, so, yeah. sorry. So it's it's that most maps you can construct can be in some sense completed to be invertible maps. Right, right. If you if you if you coarse grain enough, which is really what homotopy equivalence is doing, um, then then you can make it invertible. And so invertibility of maps, which is the same thing as saying you can go back and go forwards in a space, that that seems to be the essence of spatialness, so to speak. That so to speak, you can right. you know you you can you can move and you can move back. Um, event horizons um, are rare. Yes. Right. Right. I mean, I mean, you know, if the thing is full of event horizons, it's a shredded space and it's no longer, you know, no longer a thing like that. But so ordinary sort of flat, you know, locally civilized space, so to speak, has this feature. And what you're saying is that in the, in the, in the, the isomorphisms in the top osses are a reflection of the existence of maps that are the existence of these invertible maps, so the, the completability to getting invertible maps. Okay. Right. And actually, this is, a, I mean, I hadn't fully thought of it like this before, but actually the, the, the way you're suggesting is a really nice way to think about it, right? Because it kind of makes manifest a lot of these connections between completion, coarse graining, homotopy equivalence, and essentially rule your limits, right? Because when, if you just start from 
you know, some arbitrary multi-way system, in general, everything's going to be non, you know, th things are going to be non-invertible. You know, in, in general, it's, it, you're not going to have a reversible system. But the point is that if you keep applying this Smith Bennett completion procedure and assuming it doesn't terminate, so assuming you started from some non-decidable set of axioms of the two-way system, because you will have effectively exhausted the space of all possible rules of some of some signature. And so in that space, it's guaranteed that everything's going to be invertible. And so the rule in a multi-way system, I guess you can think of it as being an, opera, an, an operationalization of this idea that if you coarse grain out enough by homotopy equivalence, everything becomes isomorphic or everything, you know, all morphisms become isomorphisms. Right. Um, and as you say, that's kind of ultimately related to the idea that, that actually, if you mod out by homotopy equivalence, you can get rid of event horizons in some sense. Right. Or, or alternatively, right. That, 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 so the basic point is when you have enough rules for getting from here to there, you are guaranteed to have rules that take you back from there to here, so to speak. And that's the essence of having space. Right. Right. Okay. That's interesting. That's pretty cool. Okay. That, that, that helps me understand that. I mean, that's, that's related to the, you know, the whole growth and decay hypothesis type thing, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you know, this inevitable occurrence of space is kind of a, a, as I understand it, is the essence of that hypothesis. Is that correct? Yeah, in some sense, yeah. It, it, it's what the Grundig hypothesis is really saying is that when you take the, if you take the homotopy type of some space and you construct its higher homotopy types, then eventually you'll get to something that has the structure of an infinity groupoid. We kind of know that. Um, and then the, the, the homotopy hypothesis is kind of inverting that idea and it's saying, well, maybe then infinity groupoids are sort of uh, a reasonable definition for what it means to be the, the higher homotopy type of some space. So maybe everything you need to know about a topological space is encoded in some infinity groupoid. Um, and yeah, so then it, in a sense, it would, be, it would be saying precisely that, that the essence of spatiality arises in the fact that, well, A, that you can construct higher homotopies and B, that, you know, everything becomes uh, invertible when you, when, you know, when, 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 if you do yeah, that. Yeah, that's interesting. Right. I mean, okay, so let's see. We, we had originally signed up to learn about your theory of real numbers, but we have right. now segued into, um, but I mean, this is, I think, relevant to your theory of real numbers. But I don't know what your theory of real numbers is, but- No, but I, I, no it's, it's, it's absolutely relevant. Um, so, okay, the idea, the motivating idea behind this was that we want to get rid of the notion of um, having to take continuum limits in sort of in these kind of discrete models, right? Well, mm -hmm. what we'd like to be able to do is to say, because when you take it to, you know, continuum limits are kind of a mess as we've sort of established and there are various ways that you can do them. And it's not at all clear, you know, when they commute and when they give the same answer and things like that. So, so like, okay, one notion of continuum limit is you start from something like an undirected graph and you just continue adding lots and lots of edges and you just take the limit as the size of the graph goes to infinity. That's one notion of limit. Another notion of limit would be you take the length of each edge down to zero. And in a sense, when we do ordinary limits in the context of Wolfram model cases, we're, we're taking both of those limits simultaneously. Right. And we don't really know what the, commu what the commutation properties of that is. Um, another notion of limit is we could say, well, actually, let's take a graph of fixed size, but let's just average out over a very large number of them. So you're effectively smearing, you know, discrete, the, the, the discreteness over a large collection of samples. So you, you're, you're taking, okay, so you're taking an ensemble of graphs. We're not taking a single graph and looking at an ensemble of nodes. We're taking an ensemble of graphs. Right, exactly. And that gives you another notion of limit that also has, you know, the, the, where you can also obtain a continuum, but it's not immediately clear that it's the same continuum that you obtained from the first two. And, right. and things like... I mean, I can clearly see a cheat that one can do, which is to say we're going to define real numbers to be the computable reals and then, or, or something like that. And then we've got, you know, taking the continuum limit becomes a thing that is much more doable within our walled garden of computability, so to speak. And we don't have to go out and start thinking about things beyond that. And if it's then the case that the theorems of analysis still hold for the computable reals, then we're, then we're cooking, then we're done. I mean, okay. Is that, is that the, is that the logical structure? Is it, did I, did I, too much simplify that. No, so so that's the, the logical structure is to say let's not define let's not take limits at all. It's to say let's let's build a definition of the continuum that is sufficiently or of let me say let's build a definition of the reals 
that is sufficiently general that it applies both to the ordinary continuous definition of the reals that we're familiar with and also to these discrete spaces without us having to take limits, which sounds a little bit, which, which sounds like it might kind of be impossible. But, but, but I mean, um, the, the real question would be, if it walks like a real and, you know, adds like a real, then you can treat it as a real, so to speak. And the issue right. is, you, you know, like you were talking about for the constructible reals, you're saying many theorems of analysis still hold for the constructible reals. Right, What's right. an precise. example of one that, I mean, if I just try and do calculus with the constructible reals, if I say, what's the integral of x squared with constructible reals? Is that, is that a, do I get the, the, you know, x cubed over three or whatever the answer is supposed to be? Do I, yeah. do I still you, get you, that? You can absolutely, yeah, you, you can define calculus over the computable reals and, and, and have it, you just have to be a bit more careful. I mean, the, the, there are some things that hold, some things that, that don't quite work. But no, you can absolutely, you know. And is there that are, related to the, the sort of real version of infinitesimals that people often talk about in some kind of non-standard arithmetic formulation of, of calculus. Well, okay, so this is the interesting thing. So the construction that I'm gonna talk about is actually related to that because it's, so it, the spoiler alert is that if you take the Jacobson radical of the residue field for the, the, um, the ring that we construct, the, that Jacobson radical is what are sometimes called the p non-infinitesimals, which are essentially uh, infinitesimal quantities that have the algebraic properties you'd expect from infinitesimals in the context of some non-standard analysis theory. And then so the idea- there's the whole Abraham Robinson non-standard analysis business, which I've never really understood that well, but that's, so you're saying that is, that is ultimately gonna be related to the thing you're gonna talk about. Yes, yeah. Um, and, and so the, then the idea is that in effect, the, um, okay, so to really, to really skip ahead, the idea is that in, if you start from a topos that's non-classical, right, in which the law of excluded middle does not hold, then you can define a subset of the reals such that, uh, so you can define all uh, a, a subset of the reals X such that, not, uh, that X is not not equal to zero. A subset of the reals such that X is not not equal to zero. So. And that is the kind of generalized zero, basically. Right, right. So, so, so you get something that behaves a bit like zero, but also behaves a bit like a real number. And it turns out to have exactly the properties of the, um, the, the so-called penon infinitesimals, which is one, one non-standard Wow, number. that's interesting. So in other words, the not not zero numbers are the infinitesimals. That's kind exactly. Of the idea. exactly. So you're, you're exploiting the fact that we don't have excluded middle to construct this kind of weird intermediate set of, of things that are not zero, but not quite reals, uh, or not quite reals in the ordinary sense. And uh, in the context of a discrete space, those the, 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 the you can actually compute explicitly what the Jacobson radical is for something like a hypergraph or a graph or whatever, and they turn out to be exactly the edges, the you know, the, 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 the the single edges. So the intuition is that what you're saying what you're saying is that uh, if I take I if I take a, a graph or something, I can, like two points that are far away, there's a definite notion of distance, but if they're adjacent, there isn't. Right. And so, so and, and distance is effectively not not equal to zero. That's very, that's very fun. So, so you can actually grind up, just like for the ordinary reals, there is no natural way to grind them up to get the infinitesimals. But right. you're saying if the things are defined in terms of graphs, if you go grind, 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 and you get down to the infinitesimals, the infinitesimals are just individual edges. Right, precisely, precisely. That's cool, okay. All right. So now, um... so 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 formally, what's going on is um, okay. So ordinarily, all of the classical constructions of the reals, Dedekind cuts, Cauchy sequences, continued fractions, etc., they all produce uh, they all produce uh, an algebraic structure that has, as it turns out, more structure than you strictly need. So they they all at least produce a module over the field of rationals. So they all have some properties of a vector space, and in particular, what that means is that every, every time you multiply or divide by something, it's an isomorphism. So every rescaling is an isomorphism. And clearly that's incompatible with the notion of, a, of discreteness because if you take a hypergraph and you rescale it, you're, yep. like, there's gonna be microstructure that's not preserved. Um, so the question is, can you find a construction that, that relaxes those requirements? So what's the minimum construction, what's the minimum amount of algebraic structure that you'd need to, uh, did was we, we figured out, okay, we, we, you basically want, the axioms of a field, 
to be satisfied, plus the axioms of a, to of a, of a total order to be satisfied, plus the statement that that order relation should be preserved under addition and multiplication. Okay. And those are really the only axioms that you need to have something that, uh, oh, and, and you want this, you know, the, 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 obviously the continuity property, but that's kind of, that's implicit. Um, and those axioms are kind of all you need to have something that behaves exactly like how we'd expect the reals to behave, but doesn't enforce that rescaling is an isomorphism. Um, but, but, so if, okay, so in calculus, for example, what theorems of calculus require the rescaling isomorphism? Okay, so one example, well, okay, so yeah, so a theorem in, in analysis uh, that requires the rescaling isomorphism, that also, and this is a theorem that fails uh, actually also for, for some constructive models of analysis is the heine borel theorem. The statement that a, a, a subset being closed and bounded is the same as being compact. Um, so there are, there are examples of, um, so-called, uh, well, there are examples of Grothendieck topos, uh, toposes in which, in which the heine borel theorem fails. And um, that's effectively- Okay, that's constant. fairly obscure though. I mean, in, in sort of everyday calculus analysis type stuff, you're saying there is no assumption made of the rescalability of the sort of the fabric of the reals. Um, okay. I'm saying something a little bit weaker than that, which is that there are ways you can formulate the standard notions of calculus and analysis so that you avoid that. In, in, you know, in an ordinary analysis course, a bunch of the proofs will rely on things like the heine borel theorem. So in that sense, they are, they're not compatible with this idea. But the point is that there's, there's a way you can circumvent it. So you know, if, you just wanted to, if you want to define continuity, if you want to define derivatives, you want to define integrals, all those kinds of things, you can do it in such a way as to circumvent these, these problematic theorems that don't generalize to this context. Okay. But you can also do that for the purely constructible reals, yes? Yes, yeah, you can. So, I mean, as it turns out, basically all the theorems that you could prove about the constructible reals, you can also prove in this other context. So but all the things you're dealing with are bigger than the constructible reals. There's more of your things than there are constructible reals, correct? That is correct, but, but proof theoretically, they are identical. The, the same theorems you can prove about one, you could also prove about the other. So as soon as you remove the division rescale well, you have a decidable theory for the reals anyway. I'm now confused. Um, what does that mean? What is the relationship between the constructible reals and the reals without this division axiom? Uh, so, like I say, the, in, in the proof theoretic sense, they are the same. They, they, they have the same expressive power. You can express the same set of theorems. Okay. Um, this is one model of constructible reals that has this nice property that it doesn't, you know, um, it plays nicely with discrete spaces. Okay, I see. So, so in general, in the constructible reals, when you just have a Turing machine splitting out digits, there is no reason to think that that way of constructing reals will, for example, be civilized with respect to considering points on a on a graph or something right right exactly but the point is so that what you're there's... saying is you have a way of essentially you know so one thing you could imagine is every turing machine is a generator of a point and you've got some kind of generator of points as well but your generator of points generates points that have some relationship that might be like the relationship of a graph right right exactly so what is your mechanism for generating points so it's using essentially the one-sided, or no, well, in the most general case, it's using the two-sided dedekind cut construction. With Turing machines operating on, on feeding you, what is it, what is it, let's see, what is it doing? It's saying, it's, you're saying there's a, okay, in general, as a Turing machine, you can do the ordering tests for any rational number. Mm -hmm. And so you say you have a Turing machine, which is, which is a thing into which ordering tests can be fed. Right. Okay. Do you actually have a picture of one of these creatures? Uh, not, not, not one that's computationally generated, no. Okay. But you should uh, be able to generate that, right? You should be able to start, you should be able to just say, I want this machine that has this kind of property that is able to decide 
whether this rational number is bigger than or smaller than it. Right, right. It's just that implicitly it, re it would require axiomatizing certain bits of topos theory, which is a little bit scary, but I mean, it should be possible to do. Right. The, so did you, we, we're sort of, of course, we've gone beyond time here, but, but did you, um, were, there, were there like pictures that you were going to show? Uh, of, of, the, of the methods yet. Um, but so, yeah, I mean, sorry. Where, where, where does it go? So, okay, so you've got this thing, which is essentially a, a, a way of generating civil, more civilized constructible reals, geometric, right. geometry friendly constructible reals. Mm -hmm. And you're saying those are the obvious limit for, let's say, hypergraphs or something. And then you might ask, can we formulate the Einstein equations in terms of your kind of geometry friendly constructible reals? Yeah, except that it's not, the, the whole point is that it's not a limit, right? That, you're not, that, that the, the point is you could just take a, an arbitrary discrete structure and you can, the argument is you can equip it with a topology that so long as it's constructed in the way that we define, uh, will behave like the continuum would behave without you actually having to take any kind of limit. You, you know, you can you can do it on a purely finite structure. That seems bizarre because because then then you wouldn't expect. I mean, you know, if we have some random graph that has only ten nodes, we would not expect it to show kind of Einstein equation like behavior, would we? Or or is there some sense in which it is showing some? I mean, how would that how would that play out? You've got the Einstein equations on the one hand, which are defined in terms of manifolds, and you know ordinary reels and so on. And you've got your thing on the other hand, where you're saying it's, it's almost like a, a metrization or a coordinatization or something of this hypergraph that is defined. I mean, can you think of it as you're assigning coordinates to every point in the hypergraph and those coordinates are your kind of constructible reels? Um, in a sense, yes. I, I mean, so, in the sense that, that you're, you, if the coordinates you're assigning are really essentially Turing machines or Turing yeah. machine specifications, then yes, I mean, in a sense, you can think of, uh, of, that, of that as being what you're doing. And so, yeah, I mean, the, the objective for this, this general direction is to get to the point where we can start defining, you know, basically, we've now got to the point where we can define opens, we can define a locale, we can define, you know, a, a frame of opens. Uh, the idea would be to get to the point where we can start to find it well and we, we have preliminary definitions of what it means to be a derivative and what it means to be an integral over one of these spaces uh the the objective would be to get to the point where we can start defining tangent bundles when we can start defining metrics and so on um you know now once once one has some basic analysis technology it shouldn't be too difficult to kind of port over those concepts um and then yeah and, and then it, so in, in effect it would be it, the, the idea would be it would be possible to define something like the einstein field equations on a space that's purely discrete, where there's no, you know, where, where no limit okay, has been. Let, let me play back what you, what I think you're saying. So, I mean, one thing you can do is, you have this hypergraph; it's very big, and you say this is behaving. I can now map that very big hypergraph into something that's maybe like Euclidean space, where I just take every point in the, every node in the hypergraph, and I say these are its Euclidean coordinates. These are its real number, ordinary real number coordinates, and mm -hmm. given those real number coordinates. I can then do standard calculus and so on on it. And then I can say, well, that's a good approximation to doing calculus directly on the hypergraph because I've got this kind of, I don't know, covering thing that is just the real numbers, you know, the manifold that has ordinary real numbers in it. Okay, right. so your plan B is uh, instead of doing that, just take the hypergraph and now put the labeling of the points using not this is ID number such and such point, but this is a point that has this, you know, modern constructible real Turing machine label. Mm -hmm. And then say, with those labels, it becomes the case, and, and it must depend on the structure of the graph, it becomes the case that I can now define derivatives, for example, in terms of those labels. Because normally, if I, okay, here's a way to think about it, maybe. If I just have a graph and it's all got a bunch of ID numbers, there is no meaningful sense of having a derivative between ID numbers two right. neighboring nodes on the graph that have random UUIDs, there's no, there's no notion of derivative that depends only on the IDs. You're mm -hmm. saying there exists a way of assigning IDs to the nodes in the graph so that just by knowing the ID numbers, 
you can define a derivative. You need to know nothing more. You need to know no information. Okay, so, so the goal in the kind of real numberification of the graph would be that you put the graph, you know, you can assign essentially real coordinates to every node and that then just knowing those real coordinates, you can do derivatives. You can know what the derivative between these two points is just by their real number coordinates, which right. you cannot do when it's UUIDs, but you're saying you can find a way even for a finite graph to assign IDs to every node so that the, the operations of calculus, for example, can be done with respect to those ID numbers. Mm -hmm. That's right. a good idea. Yeah. That, that, that's a nice way to think about it. It's a, it's a good idea though. Okay, so, but, so presumably the assignment of those ID numbers must depend on the structure of the graph. Yeah, well, in the sense that the structure of the graph determines the topology of the set that you're, that you're dealing with in effect. Which then feeds back into the way that you actually assign those ID numbers and so on. Right, exactly. And, and, and the, the, the way that all of the, so when you define functions or whatever on, on one of these discrete spaces, well, on any of these spaces, you're doing so from the point of view of local, so, okay. Locale theory, which as I say, you know, a, a locale being this kind of generalization of the concept of a topological space is sometimes referred to as pointless topology. And the reason it's referred to as pointless topology is because a, a, a frame, a spatial frame tells you, it effectively axiomatizes open sets or what in, what in topos theory are just called opens because they're not actually sets. Um, and so it lets you do the sort of standard operations of topology, but there's no guarantee that those opens actually contain any points. Right. And that's really, really important for what we're doing, right? Because in a sense, when you, uh, when you talk about open sets in ordinary, you know, continuous topology or whatever, um, you're implicitly assuming that, you know, you can make your open sets arbitrarily small and still contain some points inside them. Um, mm -hmm. If you have a discrete structure, there's no guarantee that that's going to happen, right? Because if you make, the, if you make your open sets sure. sufficiently small, it's going, to, it's going to run out of points. There might be nothing there, yeah. Right, right. So what you want is a formal theory of open sets that tells you, you know, what are the containment relations, what are the order relations, etc., uh, that doesn't rely on those uh, on those open sets actually containing any points. And that's exactly what locale theory gives you. Um, so in a sense, when we define functions, so what, everything you said is is entirely correct. In a sense, you can think of it as being, as you say, you're, you're, you're you've got some hypergraph. You're assigning a UUID to each vertex, but the UUID is in a sense a some kind of computer some computational process that assigns if you like you know real numbered coordinates to that point or whatever um but the important thing is that the when you define concepts like derivatives or integrals or whatever um you're defining them at the level of of opens that is to say finite subgraphs you're not defining them at the level of individual vertices because uh you know the there's no guarantee that a that a function between individual vertices will even be well defined, whereas there is definitely a guarantee that a function between open sets will be defined. I see, I see, I see, I see. So, so you're saying that that the concept of assigning a quotes generalized real number to a single vertex, that what you're really doing is there's a group of vertices which act as an open set. And are you in fact assigning that ID number to that group of vertices rather than to a single vertex? Is that the right way to think about it? No, you, you can think of it as assigning ID numbers to the individual vertices. Um, it's just that when we, when we define, and, and so the point is that when we define a function, for instance, mm -hmm. um, it's always going to be a function between, uh, you know, between two opens, between two, between two subgraphs. The, so the function isn't for any particular vertex in that subgraph. The function may not be defined, but it will be defined over the whole subgraph. Okay, but, but so what that means is, in the ordinary case, you would say I've got this function and it maps. You know, I've got a real value position coordinate, and I've got some function of that coordinate. You say yeah. in this setup, you don't get to do that. You can you have to take a bag of of IDs and put all of those together as the input to the function. Right, right, exactly. So is there a way to operationalize this by, by actually generating, I mean, by having, let's see. Um, I mean, let's say you have a grid graph or something, my favorite example. I mean, in is there some way of then assigning, 
your generalized real number IDs to the nodes of a grid graph, and then thinking about the kinds of functions that you can apply to subgraphs of the grid graph. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, there's nothing. Yeah, there's nothing stopping you from doing that. Um, and I mean, obviously, in general, there'll be many, many possible assignments. But in effect, what we have is a set of rules that tells you which assignments are are valid and which aren't. Which right, will so give there's you presumably a, a simplest assignment. You can just say, I mean, so what what do you imagine will be a possible assignment? So for every node of the grid graph, would would the standard integer x y coordinates be a possible assignment? Uh, yes. I mean, so because they would certainly preserve the they would preserve enough of the spatial structure of you know two dimensional Euclidean space or whatever uh, to to yeah for for that, for that to be valid. But then what's a, what's a different one? I mean, something, for example, if I take the, you know, I take a bunch of binary bits that represent that number and I scramble them up some way, how much scrambling can I do? In principle, as much as you like. I mean, the, the, the thing with the, with the grid graph and the X and Y coordinates is that you're not, I mean, you're not making full use of the reals, right? Everything you do there is just basically natural numbered arithmetic. You're, you're defining yeah. functions on natural numbers, yeah. um, which is fine. And obviously you can do that and it will preserve, as I say, certain features of the Euclidean plane, which is enough to be able to do some geometry and some analysis. Uh, but the, the, the real power comes when, yeah, you, you have these sort of more scrambled things that are sort of, um, that are actually making use of the full, you know, the full power of the reals. But so in some sense, I mean, you need some reverse mathematics type stuff, given, you know, given your, definition of reals, what, you know, which things can you construct? I mean, in a sense, we need the reverse mathematics thing for our, um, you know, for our standard hypergraph setup of what, you know, what, what concepts of mathematics can we construct from this different, um, you know, how much do we need from the underlying, you know, setup to be able to construct different areas of mathematics? Right, right, exactly. Um, and, and so the hope would be that this approach gives one a much larger class of hypergraphs and hypergraph rewriting systems, you know, for which such concepts can be defined. So, you know, right now, the cases in which we can define a notion like a tangent bundle are really quite restricted. Um, we have to place a lot of constraints on what the, you know, what, what the rules do and how they limit. Um, the idea would be that th this will hopefully allow us to relax at least some of those restrictions. But as you say, that's effectively a reverse mathematics problem. Right. I mean, so one approach is this sort of hyperfold approach of what's the analog of a manifold that you get as the limit of a hypergraph rewriting thing. And what you're saying is, you know, put the, you know, put the emphasis not on, I mean, so in that approach, it's like you take the limit of the hypergraph until you get it to the point where you can map it onto just ordinary real number mathematics. What you're saying is instead of doing that, take the hypergraph as it is, it's a hypergraph first type approach. Um, where and then have the mathematics reverse wrap around that. Um, in uh, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, exactly. Or, or, okay, or, or to put that another way, so um, what what is it we really mean when we say we've got a hypergraph and it's limiting to a manifold? Well, one way we can operationalize that definition is we say we've got the manifold we think it's limiting to, you know, R three or whatever, um, and we know the open set structure of that manifold. We know its topology. Yep. Uh, we know the we know the subgraph structure of our hypergraph, and so for any given subgraph, we can compute its its distance, its so-called Gromov-Hausdorff distance, from its corresponding open set in the in the continuous manifold. And the statement that it convert that it limits to R three is the statement that as the hypergraph gets larger, the you know the, the global Gromov-Hausdorff distance between the between the open sets converges to zero. So. Um, that's fine, and, it, and, and as, as you say, it formally justifies the, the statement that we can start to treat the subgraphs like they are open sets of R3 as the hypergraph gets progressively larger. Another thing you could do is just say, let's assign a topology directly to a hypergraph in its finite state in such a way that the Gromov-Hausdorff distance between, uh, the, you know, between subgraphs and corresponding open sets is minimized. And then effectively, you, you've got a a topology that is as close to the R3 topology as you can get on one of those discrete spaces. And let's see what, you know, let, let, let's see if anything breaks if we do that. And yeah. the, the interesting thing is that a lot of the stuff you think might, you know, might conceivably break doesn't if you slightly relax the, you know, the, 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 at least this one property that you'd expect the real numbers to satisfy, which is this uh, effectively this rescaling isomorphism.
So just, I mean, there have been a bunch of questions on our live stream here, and there's several about the continuum hypothesis. And I'm, I'm just curious to come back to that and ask the question for, for this setup where it's the mathematics that changes, you know, the numbers are as they come out from the hypergraph, but you change the mathematics around them, so to speak. What is then the question? I mean, uncountability, for example, what does that turn into when it's a change the mathematics play rather than a change what's underneath play? I mean, so th these notions still exist in this more general context, right? Because we can take, we can ask, does there exist, you know, in any topos, any topos that has a natural, so um, McLean gives you a way of constructing a natural number object in a kind of arbitrary topos or more or less arbitrary topos. And so we can just ask, is there an isomorphism effectively? Is there a, a bijective map from that natural number object to, for instance, you know, the real number object that we've constructed by this procedure? And the answer is gonna be no uh, in general. Now the, the, the generalized reals that we produce in this way are still effectively a power object. They still have the property of being the power object of the natural number object. So we know that they're uncountable in that sense. Um, and, and do they, does, that, does that fact that they are the power object of the natural numbers, does that immediately imply the validity of the continuum hypothesis? No, 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 no more than it does for ordinary classical mathematics, right? So, so, so we know that the cardinality of the continuum is two to the RLF null. And the continuum hypothesis is effectively asking, is that the same as RLF one? Um, so we, we can define an analog of RLF one as being effectively the, you know, the, the cardinal associated with the smallest object in the topos for which an isomorphism with the natural number object can't be constructed. And then the question is, is that object really, is that object itself isomorphic to the real number object? But wait a minute, so, RLF one is simply the cardinality of the reals, right? Well, no, no, that, that's what the continuum hypothesis is asking. We know the cardinality of the reals is two to the RLF null. Right, because it, it because it uh, you know because it's the power object of the natural right, because right right right, uh, right okay so what is what is the independent definition of LF one? So LF one is simply to, is defined precisely as being the smallest cardinal that is not equal to LF null. The smallest what, infinite cardinal that's that's larger than LF null. By what definition of uh, now I'm uh, now I'm getting myself confused again. I, I, I know much less about the cardinals than about the ordinals. But um, so, so what, um, uh, and I don't know that much about the ordinals either, but, but um, uh, so what is the definition then of what, what defines the smallest cardinal that is, so how do you define the smallest cardinal? But how, what do you even mean by smallest cardinal? Right, okay, so, so if you can construct a bijection then between the corresponding sets, then we know the cardinals are equal. If you can force one set to be a subset of the other, then we know that the cardinal that the cardinal associated with the first is smaller than the cardinality than the cardinal associated with the second. Okay. Right. So the statement of the continuum hypothesis is that there does not exist uh, an intermediate cardinal between RLF null and 2 to the RLF null. Right. So in other words, if I take the natural numbers and I take the power set of the natural numbers, that th there shouldn't exist any set that has, uh, you know, whose cardinality is strictly between them. Um, in other words, su such that, that that set is a subset of the power set of the naturals right. so and what, what, the naturals are a subset of it. What you're saying, therefore, is that there are the constructible reals and there are the reals and there's nothing in between them. Uh, well, in the, in the sense that the constructible reals have cardinality RLF null, yes. Right, which they do. Yeah. But, but so that means, for example, that, you're, that there's no junior version of the reals. In other words, as you, as you turn down from the reals, you will immediately drop down to the constructible reals. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting way to think about it. I mean... Yeah. And I mean, once again, it kind of, so I mean, a, a question that one might ask for physicists from um, before, before anybody paid attention to efforts like mine, so to speak, the, um, you know, 
if physicists believe that physics is based on truly real numbers, okay, what they're saying is that physics has made the jump from Aleph zero to Aleph one, basically. And it's a very strange thing because it would mean that, what would that actually mean? What would that mean that, that um, I mean, it seems so deeply unnatural with respect to the things that we figured out if physics were actually to live in Aleph one. What would it mean? What could we say if physics lived in Aleph one? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, so one thing that has interested me for a while, and which I know is something that Matthew Sudzik has written some stuff about, is um, essentially looking at even if the, you know, even if the universe operated on continuous mathematics, could you, you know, would your experiments, would the experiments you could perform necessarily constrain you in such a way that the, you know, the outcomes, the observables, would necessarily still be computable? In other words, you know, effectively, if you had a, a, a discrete universe and a continuous universe, and you modded out by everything that you could experimentally test, would they ultimately be equivalent? Right. I mean, this, this is a claim that I made in the NKS book that basically that even if you have real numbers underneath, experiments symbolically described by humans will never be able to tell. And right. another way to put that is, you know, given the Rouliad, as we're now calling it, of, of this, you know, Rouliad multi-way system limit, the, you know, you can certainly imagine a hyper Rouliad that is, you know, that uses more than standard Turing computability to compute it. But Insofar as, so, so the basic claim is, the fundamental fact of natural science would be, we live in the Rouliad and not the Hyper-Rouliad. That, right. that would be the fundamental statement of natural science that is otherwise, which is equivalent to saying the principle of computational equivalence is true, which is equivalent to saying, you know, Turing computability is as far as you can get, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it is essentially a statement of saying, you know, we happen to live in, just like we happen to live in this galaxy and not another one, you know, we happen to live at this time in the history of the universe and not another one. It will be saying we happen to live in the Rouliad and not the hyper Rouliad. And therefore that's why we can only observe. That's why we can never, and I don't really know the relationship between the hyper Rouliad and real numbers. That's another different question. I mean, that, that rely, comes back to that question I was asking earlier about what an Oracle would do to the, um, uh, you know, to the, to the constructible reals plus an oracle, do you, at what point the expectation would be, you will not, okay, okay, this is a little bit tricky because here's, here's the intuition, right? The expectation will be you will not reach the genuine reals until you go to an infinite level in the arithmetic hierarchy, right? That just going one oracle up, you know, a, a pi one oracle or something isn't gonna be enough to, to get you to the, to the genuine reals, okay? Yeah, I think that's right. Now, then, isn't it a little bit surprising that the continuum hypothesis will be true? Because wouldn't you expect there to be things that are the constructible reals plus the pi seven oracle or something, but not the full infinite hierarchy of, of, um, uh, of oracles that got you to the genuine reals? In other words, in, in some sense, there is a separation between the Oracle Turing machines and the ordinary Turing machines. And why doesn't that separation produce intermediate cardinalities of, of numbers? Well, that, that could only happen if the, um, if the description language, for, I mean, for any finite yeah, level in the right. mathematical hierarchy, you'd need a description language for the oracles that was not countable. Yeah, you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right. The problem is this, that, that while you can have an Oracle that says, you know, I can tell you whether this Turing machine is going to halt or not in finite time. The question that you're asking it is a question about Turing machines, which is a question about countable, uh, you know, integer type things. Right, right. And so, so I, I think I think the limit only works because you're taking you're, you're taking a limit of a of a of a tree of different uh, of, you know of, of different models of computation that all have countable description languages. But then you know you take the limit as the tree grows to infinity and the description right. the and, whole and thing. that's by the way has to be the argument for why you would need to go to the infinite level in the arithmetic hierarchy to reach the reals is right, because right, basically exactly. what you'd have is you know the infinity that is getting you to the continuum 
is the infinity that comes from the hierarchy of the arithmetic hierarchy, so to speak, rather than from the infinity of an individual Turing machine. Right. That's exactly. actually interesting. I'd not really realized that. So in other words, it is a very different thing. I think I actually had some note about this in a case. I think I did know. I did understand this 25 years ago, that, that the, there is a difference between oracles for Turing machines and, you know, in other words, to get beyond Turing computability with an oracle is a much weaker act than to ask for real number computation. Yeah. Yeah. Real number computation is very strong. And um, yeah, interesting. Okay. Well, actually, there's, there's an interesting question about, which I, I, I think we may have discussed at some point before, but I couldn't really remember your answer to it. But um, is there any reason to believe that, you know, okay, so, so if, if we did live in a continuous universe, um, why would I, why would I not, in principle, be able to set up some kind of sense, you know, some system with very sensitive dependence on initial conditions that could excavate, uh, you know, arbitrarily high order digits in initial conditions and use that to do essentially hypercomputation? Right. I have certainly thought about this. Let me see if I can unravel the argument here. <laughs> um, the uh, so so the question is. Yes, yes. The, the problem is, is straightforward. Let's say you're going to use a bunch of planets. You're going to set them up very, very carefully. You know, you've got, I think, in, in our solar system, we've now excavated 20 or 30 digits. I've forgotten. Some, some, num some decent number of digits in the, in the known evolution of the solar system. Okay. Let's imagine you can do a computation that's based on that. Well, you have to set up the, the initial, you know, while you will be excavating, the setup, the feeding in of initial data has to be done by some kind of finite procedure. You, can't, you mm. don't get to feed in the initial data. If you want to make use of the fact you can infinitely excavate, what are you gonna infinitely excavate on? Unless you say, I'm gonna infinitely excavate the reservoir of randomness from the universe, which then you're in a different situation altogether, you still have to prepare the initial state. And so even though the actual process of planets going around and, and you know, end body problems and, and sensor dependence on initial conditions and so on can be sensor dependent on the initial conditions. If your initial conditions were still finitely set up, you're still back in the same box. But, so, but that, that is basically the same argument as the, you know, you can't set up an experiment that, you know- It is, yes, it's the same argument. Yep, yeah, okay. It's the same argument. There's no, the, it, the sensor dependence on initial conditions doesn't really get you anywhere. Yeah. Um, and, and well, uh, at least it, 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 the, the most it could in principle get you is, is sort of noise that you didn't, you know, that you didn't yourself introduce. That's correct. That's correct. So, I mean, you know, for our models, it's an interesting question whether, okay, actually it's something we have not thought about. Okay. So the gravitational microscope that attempts to see below the continuum, you know, version of space, we have thought about that in terms of you know, supercritical black holes and things like this. But I wonder if there's a time evolution version of that in which basically you are, let, let's say in the, um, how would we notice? Well, here's how we would notice. Imagine, I mean, it's not something we can explicitly do right now, but imagine, yeah, here's the point. Imagine you have a bunch of solar systems and they are, effectively excavating their initial data, and they're doing it really well. Here's the point. There will be only a finite set of possible solar system configurations. You might think based on real numbers and based on the concept that the planets could be in arbitrary initial positions, that there would be an infinite set of configurations of the solar system, but there would not be. Because in fact, it's a, it's a countable, there is a point at which those two different configurations of the initial configurations of the solar system have to be discreetly different. And so there is no configuration in which, you know, the planet Mars has a moon moon or something that, um, uh, you know, that, that, in other words, there's a discrete jump. It's the same thing actually, as, you know, a theory of physics where, you know, there are a discrete set of possible values of the electron mass or something, because there are discrete jumps between possible theories. But this is a space-time version of that, where we're saying there are discrete jumps between the possible configurations of the solar system because the initial data can't be can't be defined in terms of an arbitrary real number. Well, so so an obvious 
follow on question then is, which I don't know whether this has been investigated in the context of conventional dynamical systems theory is, you know, what does, for instance, what does the Poincare, what happens to the Poincare recurrence time of a, of a dynamical system as you progressively kind of discretize and coarse grain the config, you know, the, the, the phase space? Yeah, it's a total mess. What happens with the real numbers is, is utterly different because with, with real numbers, you can have infinite recurrence times. Right? With, with finite, you know, with a discrete system, you cannot have an infinite recurrence time. And the question of what... Uh, right, right but, know, no, a, but, the, but the point I'm making is, so obviously we know with, with ergodicity that the recurrence time for any given, you know, for any error epsilon will be finite. For, you know, for, for an ergodic dynamical system. But presumably that recurrence time as a function of epsilon will depend on discretization scale if you try to approximate, you know, yes. if, if you discretize it. Definitely. And right. do we know, I mean, if something, if anything is, if either if anything is known or if we can figure something out about that dependence, that would again, give us in principle a way of doing uh, at least probably- uh, No, not, not the whole cellular automaton is infinite precision. A small, width of column of cells is like the analog of a finite precision number. And so what you're asking is, given that you look only at that column of cells, you're asking the question, what, you know, as a function of the width of that column, that's your epsilon value, what, uh, what can you say about the recurrence time for that column of cells, as opposed to the recurrence time for the whole system? I bet there's a note in NKS about that, but I don't remember what the answer is. Um, I mean, that that yes, I certainly have looked at things like that, although not quite. If that if that piece of you know dynamical systems theory is actually known in generality, that's a nice experimental prediction, right? Because it, it means that you could just basically from like a simple gas in a box experiment, you can make a, you can make deductions about uh, you know bounds on the discretization scale. Yeah, except that you can't measure the Poincaré recurrence time. Well, because Not even close. Long, because, because, because to know the Poincare recurrence time, you have to know the precise configuration of the gas. As soon as you're in the gas law limit, all of that's gone away. Hmm. Fair enough. I mean, I, I think that, that there might be some more quantum mechanical version of that where you're looking at, I mean, because the recurrence time in quantum mechanics is more related to, you know, I mean, that's a period that's related to energies and so on. But I, I think it's some... Um, uh, I mean, that's up. Um, uh, are you using space filling curves? Are we using space filling curves? Not particularly, I think, is the... Is the um, uh, I mean, if, if you wanted to have your hypergraph coordinate system only use one real number per vertex, you could do that with space filling curves, I guess, but... Sure, it's like zip codes. I mean, <laughs> right. Like you can you can go and you can you know you can snake through the graph, um, uh, how you want. Okay, let's see. Um, uh, well, no, actually, I mean that, that's not a totally. I don't, I don't think that's a totally uninteresting problem, right? What, so, if you start looking at graph filling curves rather than space filling curves. Sure. Is there a, is there a, I mean, presumably the taxonomy of graph filling That's curves. otherwise known as Hamiltonian circuits. Right, right. Yeah, true. I mean, interestingly, a graph filling curve, to even find a graph filling curve is an MP complete problem, mm -hmm. which yeah, might tell you something. In that's other a good words, point. Sorry, please. No, no, in the, in the limit, labeling, that is sort of interesting because it tells you that a numerical labeling of a graph by its graph filling curve parameter to find a graph filling labeling is MP complete. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you know, the, the limit of that is going to be some kind of undecidable type thing. So for an infinite graph, although I don't even know what, I mean, an infinite graph as, Okay, so here's a question that, that there are presumably computable graphs in the same sense that there are computable numbers. Mm -hmm. um, and there are, I mean, graphons 
are a real number, real number like way of feeding into, you know, they're essentially making the adjacency matrix as a real number function. Um, and, uh, uh, but you can imagine, um, so I think, yeah, I mean, this question about the graph filling curve is gonna wind up being a halting problem on the machine that generates the graph. If you, if you were to have a computable graph generated that way. Mm -hmm. But I, I was actually, I was thinking more in the sense of that gives you um, a generalization of the notion of a pairing function, but to domains where your topology is much more weird. Let me walk through that. So, so you're saying, in a, in a, uh, I mean, a pairing function takes, for example, a pair of numbers and packages them up as a single number. And it does that, you can think of that as a way of, of a space filling curve that walks through the two dimensional plane, you know, right. picking up every, every pair of numbers, every coordinate position. So what you're saying is, um, yes, that's, that's right. That, that, that would be a, it is a numericalization of a much more complicated space, which by right. the way, is not that different from what you're doing, except it's a completely different approach. Right. 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 It's, a, it's an alternative numericalization of a, um, I mean, look, just as you can imagine, in, in some sense, to put a space filling curve onto the graph is one thing you could do. You could also throw a space filling net over the graph, mm -hmm. which would be kind of like a two dimensional, you know, it's like, give me, my, give me my nodes in the graph in a one dimensional ordering, give me my nodes in the graph mapped onto a two dimensional net. Mm -hmm. And that's um, um, both things might, might be possible. I just I think it's interesting because like ordinarily one thinks of pairing functions as you know taking pairs of integers or triples. No, I agree. It's like suddenly you can define pairing functions over like two point three dimensional spaces, and it's kind of I don't know. That's, yeah, I think it's interesting. Okay, we should we should add that also to the list of projects for the next summer school. Um, <laughs> I need to I need to uh, I'm just using low tech paper here, but I'm I'm um, uh, uh, graph pairing functions. Um, uh, Besides curry howard Lambeck isomorphism, Parmenides asks, what does type theory and category theory give us that topology doesn't? That's not my kind of question. Jonathan might, might have a, a comment on that. That sounds uh, like a long topic. Xerxes may have a more sensible answer to that than I do. I don't know. Um, I mean, my well, over here, I mean, it depends. I mean, on one hand, there's a whole philosophical thing to it. On the other hand, there's a whole foundational aspect of mathematics itself. So there are many ways you can think of formalizing mathematics. And it's, it's not just about curry Howard type. It's, it's really about uh, if, if one wants to take a constructivist approach to mathematics, then type theory is not even a theory, but it is more a kind of framework uh, within which, they, and there are in fact many type theories. It's not just one type theory. Uh, it, it, it's a framework for, for giving kind of a quote unquote reference frames of axioms through which you build universes of mathematics. And through that, one gains the understanding that mathematics was never meant to be thought of as some kind of a prior fixed kind of universal axiomatization, but you have these, these alternative schemas in which you can translate from one to another. And this whole machinery of type theory opens that window and, and, and the tools to do, do it and see it that way. So in a sense, it's, uh, it's giving you a different way to look at the foundations of mathematics itself. Although it would be said that you can pick different axiom systems and still, I mean, in principle, you can pick different axiom systems for the integers, for, you know, for, for arithmetic and still get the integers. So that, that's like different, you know, different reference frames for- Right, I mean, right. But, but you're doing that as, as different type theories now. So, so, base, so what is a type theory? It's not, a, it's not really a theory. It's actually just a, a Lego kit. It's a, a set of construction tools. And within that, you're defining constructors uh, yeah. by, by way of the, the, the kind of building blocks, the, the, the initial inference rules, axioms, et cetera. You're building everything as, as some kind of composite types. So, well, so this is really is, the, the machine code of, of all of what one would assume or in the past assume that mathematics just started from axioms. You, this is the machine code of all that. But, but an alternative way to put it is 
One point of view is there's some initial sort of protoplasm of mathematics and the axiom systems are carving out particular cookie cuttered areas that satisfy certain constraints. That's one model of how you make mathematics. Another model that you're attributing to type theory is that you instead build up from your Lego construction kit, you know, types and types, of, you know, dependent types and all this kind of thing where you're building things up from the construction kit rather than cookie cuttering out of the, by constraints out of the protoplasm, so to speak. Is that a reasonable way to think about it? Yeah, that's right. But of course, there's a sl kind of a slight circularity also in the sense that uh, whether one really wants to assume that this protoplasm, uh, the cut pieces of the protoplasm are to be thought of as fundamental A given, or one should think that through the Legos, you can actually be, look at all okay. possible such cut pieces. And, right. and, in, and maybe at a, at a, at a, in the sense that we describe our, our things, literally you should look at all possible cases, which meaning that all possible universes. Yeah, but you see, I think what, what's, gonna, what's gonna clinch things is, the, um, uh, is humans being in this loop. Because exactly. in the end, this protoplasm thing is not a human accessible thing in the same way that the real number, you know, that a, a potential LF1 physics is not a human accessible thing. Right. And in, in a way, that's very much related to the question of whether all this is being seen from the outside or from the inside. That's true. That's true. I mean, if the humans are, um, uh, yeah, yeah, interesting. In, in okay. terms of an actual answer to that particular question, though, so so topology, conventional topology only tells you, essentially, only gives you information at the level of, you know, which maps are, ho are homotopically equivalent, which paths are homotopically equivalent, which spaces are homotopically equivalent, etc. Type theory and category theory give you a finer grained version of, of, of the, a, a way of thinking about those equivalences. So if you look at the homotopy category of top, the, the, the category of topological spaces, that's got the same object set as top. So it's got, so every object is still a topological space, but now the morphisms are no longer continuous maps. The morphisms are homotopy classes of continuous maps. And so the homotopy category is giving you strictly more information than ordinary topology would give you because it's telling you exactly how you, you know, how this uh, homotopy equivalence relation is being constructed in terms of, in terms of equivalence classes of maps. The homotopy type then takes you even further. So now it, every term in the homotopy type is, you know, is, is, is a topological space. And then there's an explicit deduction rule that lets you construct the, you know, the, 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 the sets of homotopy equivalences. So in a sense, category theory is making mathematically explicit what topologic, what, what ordinary topology is keeping implicit. And type theory, and the theory of homotopy types in particular, is making computationally explicit what ordinary topology uh, sort of treats as being implicit. Um, sorry, just for that, on that particular. Well, there's more to say about that, I think. And, and, and okay, we, we better, we, we really need to wrap up, but I'm just going to look at memes as asking, is it possible to use a sheaf to help us make sense of combinators? I have no comment because I don't know about sheaves. Anybody who knows about sheaves want to comment on that? Well, I mean, it's trivial to make. So a, a, any combinatory logic deduction forms a pre-sheaf. Um, I don't know the conditions that would need to be, I don't know what the sheaf condition would enforce on that combinatory logic deduction. Um, but right, it's, okay. it should be some kind of gluing, but what does that mean here, right? Of The, the question is, is there a natural formulation of combinators in terms of sheaf theory. I don't have a clue, but. Well, like I said, I mean, it, it's pretty obvious that any combinatory logic deduction can be formalized as a functor from offset to, to well, set. Minute, combinatory logic is different from combinators. Combinatory logic is a bunch of equivalence relations. Combinators right, right. are just, you run the thing and you see what it does. Right, so combinatory logic is the, is the, is the two-way deduction version of combinators, of right. combinatory calculus. Right. So. To, to even define a pre-sheaf, you need a topos. You need to have the ability to construct isomorphisms. So you need to be working with combinatory logic, not combinatory calculus. Well, see, see an interesting question here is in, in my efforts last year on combinators, the notion of a space did not really show up. It was not easy to make a space-like thing out of combinators. And so it will be interesting in your kind of theory of, you know, what does it take to make an isomorphism type thing what you're implicitly pointing out is that maybe the combinatory logic level is something more 
accessible to spatialization or whatever than regular combinators. Right. I mean, in the, in the sense that passing from, common, from a combinatory calculus to a combinatory logic is the analog of a localization procedure in homotopy theory. I see. So I see that that's that's doing by localization procedure. You mean this thing you were describing earlier about taking equivalence classes of um, uh, I see. Right. So, and and, and so, so then then the, the, the deductions that would otherwise be one way now become two way. So in effect, if you think of it in, in a category theoretic sense, you're you're taking morphisms and you're making them into isomorphisms. So the way that you would obtain a so the way you'd get a topos structure is by having some procedure that lets you essentially convert from a combinatory calculus to a combinatory logic. Um, which, for instance, is what find combinator proof does. Um, but Explain then, that comment. Wait, 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 wait. What, what does find combinator proof do? It, it's so okay. There's a way to prove implicative theorems using an equational theorem proving system. Right. That's what find equational proof does when it proves stuff using you know, in, in 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 full predicate logic. Okay. Yep. So find combinator proof, if it's given a combinatory calculus rather than a combinatory logic, will do that operation. It, it, it will convert the implicative form of the combinator rules into something that's, that's effectively equational, and then do the theorem proving over that. And that you can think of as being analogous to a localization procedure, as being the analog of modding out by homotopy equivalence. So what, what this is basically telling us is, when we look not at individual combinators, but at whole ensembles of combinators, that is where we get a spatial structure. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, I missed that, I think, in my efforts on combinators last year. Good thought. Okay, we need to wrap up, but I'm just noticing one more comment here that I can't resist looking at. Um, Oh, come now. No, I don't believe this. The, this is about, um, uh, you know, the proof that, that um, a proof from things to do with the, the, um, the orbit of Mercury, that space isn't discrete, not a chance. The, not a chance. So far off from being something that would be plausible, I'm afraid. Um, the, anyway, uh, all right, more interesting comments and questions here, but I think we don't have time for them today. Um, and uh, good, well, thanks Jonathan, that was, that was fun. I, I always, uh, um, that was a uh, fast paced tour of, of um, uh, where we almost reach reality or the reels or something. Um, Okay, well, good. All right, well, thanks. And um, uh, thanks to folks on the live stream, particularly for a number of rather insightful comments there. Um, and uh, until the next time.